Mr. Igar is present for Mr. Peterson, who likewise is present. We are outside the presence of the jury. State anything you need me to address before we resume your presentation. No. Defense, anything you need me to address before we resume your presentation. No. State, uh, are you introducing any evidence to this last witness? Yes, I am, Judge. It's been pretty marked as 3A and it will be coming in if the court permits it as 52. Is that something that can be shown on the TV screens? Yes, it, it's a transcript. Um, oh, it's a transcript. Okay. However, for the remaining visual evidence, we will ask that the camera remain off. All right, so. Evidence, but it's already in evidence. Everything is off. Okay. All right, very good. Okay, please bring the jury back to
all the way up here so that we can stand? Yes, sir. Once you reach it, but before you have a seat, you can just stop and look at me. Go ahead and tell the truth, whole truth, nothing but the truth. I do. Please be seated. Thank you, sir. And sir, once you are seated, I'll get you to scoot that chair up as far forward as it will go. If you can please state your full name and spell your full name. John William Joseph Curcio, last name spelling C-U-R-C-I-O. And Jay Alita. Yes, sir. Ms. Phillips, you may inquire. Thank you, Judge. Good morning, Detective Curcio. How are you? Please introduce yourself to the jury and tell them where you work. Uh, my name is John Curcio. I work currently for the Broward Sheriff's Office. How long have you worked for the Broward Sheriff's Office? Uh, 2009, I started with the Sheriff's Office. Give the jury a little background on what you did before 2009. Uh, 1980, I joined the Fort Lauderdale Police Department. Uh, I retired from them in 2009. Uh, I did 13 years as a homicide detective for the Fort Lauderdale Police Department. Ten days after I retired, I joined the Sheriff's Office, where I've been a homicide detective with them, other than the original, I think, uh, 10 or 11 months, they wanted to see me in uniform, so I did uniform, and then I went back to working homicides for the Sheriff's Office. When you say they wanted to see you in uniform, do you mean that after retiring as a homicide detective, you went back to the road? Yes. Yeah, for the sheriff's office, I worked for uh, uh, the city of Lauderdale Lakes as a uniformed officer. It was just part of VSO's uh, standard protocol that when you were a new employee, you had to do some time in uniform. Once you completed your time on the road, did you go straight into, I don't know if you refer to it as a detective bureau? Yes, I went straight to becoming a homicide detective for the sheriff's office. Now. Over your time as a detective um, handling homicides, uh, if you know approximately how many homicides have you handled? Uh, well, I mean, I've, I've handled hundreds of homicides, but we do other things than homicides. We do any form of unattended deaths, which could be uh, an accidental death, a suicide. Um, I've done thousands of, of those type of investigations, but several hundred homicides. Explain generally for the jury how a detective is assigned to a particular case. Well, normally we, at the sheriff's office, we're, we're a team. We have a two-man team, and we're on call for periods of uh, two weeks at a time. Unless you get involved in a homicide investigation, then you're taken off call for that. During that two-week period of time, you handle all the rest of the uh, death investigations that I described uh, in that two-week period of time. Back in 2018, you were a homicide detective, correct? Yes. Explain for the jury what your connection is to the MSD case as it relates to your role as a homicide detective. I was the lead detective assigned that investigation. As the lead detective, who were you investigating? Uh, well, we charged Nicholas Cruz with that particular incident. Did you respond to the school on February 14th? Yes, I did. Explain for the jury what you were doing that day when you first received the call. Uh, myself and about five or six homicide detectives were in our uh, homicide squad room, which is at 2601 West Broward. One of our lieutenant colonels kind of came running into the squad room and said there was a shooting up at the school, and we all, all the homicide detectives that were in the squad room, uh, ran down to our cars, jumped in our cars, put on our lights and sirens, and responded up the turnpike to uh, Stoneman Douglas. Do you recall approximately what time you arrived on campus? Um, not without looking at the actual timeline. I know we got to the scene right around the same time that the Broward Sheriff's Office SWAT team was starting to make entry into the west side of the 1200 building. So I'd have to look at the timeline. We got up there relatively quickly because we were able to park right alongside of uh, the 1200 building uh, on the east roadway. And after a few minutes, there were so many cars up there, you couldn't park within miles of, of the school. And the reason I ask, when you're responding to the scene, what's your understanding as to whether it's an active scene or? Well, again, all we knew was that at, at, when the lieutenant colonel kind of told us what was going on, that there was a shooting, there had been somebody had been shot, and we didn't know much more of that. When we were, you know, I was in my car separately as, as we're going up the turnpike you know, as fast as we could. So uh, there wasn't a lot of information that we knew other than what the lieutenant colonel had told us. When you arrived on campus, 
what is the approach you took as far as responding to this scene? Was there a specific approach because of the term active shooter? Well, again, when we got to the scene, we were able to park uh, the, the group of uh, homicide detectives I'm describing on the east side, and there were hundreds of students self-evacuating the school when we got there. They were coming off every, every exit point they could. And as we were coming out of our cars, we were trying to gather intelligence or information as to what was going on on campus from them as they were running by us. We were making them drop their, their backpacks and we were trying to get some intelligence information as to what actually was going on. Explain for us why in that moment when you're arriving to the scene of a shooting, you would stop and talk to the children. Well, again, I didn't have any idea really what was going on at the school at that point. So you're trying to gain information so you know what to do as a police officer. Is there any active shooting going on while you're doing this? No, there was no gunshots going off. Just uh, all the kids self-evacuating. Did the lack of gunshots impact your response at all? Well, when you respond on any scene, whether it's an active shooter or anything in police work, you're, you're trying to gather intelligence as to what you're, what you're dealing with. So when you're not hearing the shots, you're, you're still trying to gather intelligence from the students. Where is something happening? What did you see? What did you hear? Uh, you know, to react to what you're going to do. And if you were hearing shots, what does your training dictate that that would change? You're supposed to go towards the shots to find out, investigate what's going on. Is that true for a domestic or any scene? Yes. When you stopped those children and spoke to them, were you able to gather any information? No, none of the kids had any information. We kind of, again, we asked them to go. Uh, there was a berm on the road further east to all sit down over there. And while we were talking to, the, again, the, the groups that were just filing out of the school, other detectives were kind of like still questioning the groups that were sitting on the berm and, and no one had any information as to what was going on on the campus. While this is happening, are you explained that SWAT had already arrived, correct? Yes. And so were there a significant, was there a significant officer presence already working the 1200 building? Well, I can only see SWAT on the west side. We, I didn't, when we first got there, I didn't know who was in the 1200 building at that point. I just knew they were on the west side doors starting to make entry. So yeah, there was there was police presence, but you know, I can we can only see what was on the east side uh, along the 1200 building down to the bus loop. I couldn't tell what was on the west side because the buildings blocked our view. What happens next? Um, at one point, while we're on that um, site, again, still trying to interview all these students coming off, there was a radio communication that I heard from another detective's radio uh, from somebody in the video room saying that the shooter was coming down from the third floor to the second floor of the 1200 building. And uh, then there was a pause and then eventually we realized that somebody was looking at the video from 20 minutes earlier and describing what they had seen in the building 20 minutes earlier. So it was not uh, real time information. What happens when you realize that that information is lagged? Uh, again, we're still doing the same thing, trying to gather intelligence from the, the, the kids coming off campus. Um, shortly thereafter, somebody came up with the name of the suspect and put it over the radio. So now we're actually re-engaging with the students who came off the campus who are sitting on the berm or coming off. Anybody know what Nicholas Cruz looks like? We had no idea. He could have been in the group we had. Uh, separated on the berm. So at some point it does become known to the officers on scene that the shooter has left the building. We, they knew that the video feed was 20 minutes earlier. He had left the 1200 building, but they didn't know he had left the campus, I don't think. But they knew he left the 1200 building because you could see that. When you realize that the shooter has left the building, as a detective that's going to be handling homicide, this specific homicide, what is your role in that moment? Well, again, my moment, we're still doing all the things we, we've been doing since the moment we stepped up there, but now I'm talking to students, I'm on my phone trying to get on social media, trying to come up with a picture of Nicholas Cruz, I'm trying to get um, any of the students who know him to provide me a picture so we know what this guy looks like. Uh, and then one of the assistant principals who's kind of in this, you know, this mass of students, hears the name 
and says, I know what he, you know, I know what Nicholas Cruz looks like because I had done a threat assessment with him at the school. And that was uh, Denise Reed. Was Denise Reed able to provide you with a photograph? She was trying to get it through um, ROTC, I believe, again, through the school radio communication system. Um, and then we heard over the radio that uh, he had been stopped. So Denise Reed got in a car with homicide detective Zach Scott uh, and myself and Zach Scott in separate vehicles started heading down to the location where Nicholas Cruz had been detained. How far from the school was Nicholas Cruz detained? Uh, several miles. He was down in the Coral Springs in a residential area. Was the route that he took when he left the campus learned? Uh, eventually, as the investigation proceeded, he, uh, he went uh, westbound through uh, the school grounds. He blended in with the other students, self-evacuating, ended up in the Walmart, uh, which is just west of the school. Then he traveled down to a McDonald's, which is just southwest of the school, and then eventually into the residential area where he was detained. Was it learned which side of the 1200 building he exited? Yeah, he, he exited yeah. the west side, once, or the west doors. Once the uh, shooter was detained, did you respond to the area that he was being held? I attempted to, but again, by the time all this is occurring, the traffic was, it was incredible because you had every uh, law enforcement, paramedic, fire department, family members all heading to the school, plus you had normal rush hour traffic. I never got down there before they ended up transferring him up to Broward uh, Medical North to be medically cleared. So I kind of like diverted halfway down to where he was detained to get to the hospital, which was where he was being brought to. All right, I know this investigation was very vast, so I'm gonna streamline it a bit, but did you ultimately interview the shooter? Yes, I did. Explain for the members of the jury just generally approximately how long you spoke with the shooter, not what the contents of that conversation. Um, I spoke to him for several hours, but I was with him probably for, and again, I'd have to look at my notes, anywhere between 10 and 12 hours before I ended up uh, actually formally booking him on a probable cause charge. As the lead detective on this case, explain uh, what your role would be as far as walking the crime scene. Is that something you ever did in this case? Yes. After, after we formally booked him and he was brought to the jail, I ended up going up to the crime scene where the other homicide detectives had remained uh, from the time that myself and Zach Scott left uh, to go where he had been you know, originally stopped. Did you familiarize yourself with the campus and with the 1200 building? Yes. Approximately how many hours or days initially in this investigation did you spend on that campus? Having walked the campus. Well, I mean, we did the walkthrough over the course of the, the year that this investigation took against Nicholas Cruz several times. Um, more so was the video that we watched and, and uh, ended up uh, reviewing more times than we did walkthroughs, at least for myself. Are you familiar then with the surveillance system at the school? Yes. You're familiar with where certain cameras are placed and located? Yes. And you familiarize yourself with the location of the particular 12, in the 1200 building as to where the camera angle is looking at? Yes. Now, as part of your investigation, did you learn the names of the victims that were located on each individual floor? Yes, I did. Explain for the members of the jury how that happened in those first hours or days. All right, when I was actually at the public safety building with the suspect, uh, again, a team of homicide detectives remained on the scene. Um, and they were the ones who physically were able to identify each of the victims, um, which took a period of time because, again, uh, some of the students didn't have identification on them. Uh, and it, it took several hours for us to get their, their true names. And I, I don't mean to be crass when I say this, but by the time you walked the first floor and the third floor, had the deceased been removed? Yes, all, all the victims had been removed by the time I got up there. Was it part of your job as understanding the crime scene to know, nevertheless, where each victim had died? Yeah, I walked through with the detectives who were on the scene. Um, the video itself actually showed a clearer uh, 
portrayal of where they were when they passed. Because once the entry team began to come in to try to um, rescue the kids in the classroom, the living kids, some of the victims' deceased bodies had to be moved away from doorways so that entry could be made. So um, not only did I speak to the detectives who were on the scene who found, you know, saw and found where the victims had been moved to, you watched the video where you could tell where they actually fell before they were moved. And after watching that video, you yourself walked and were able to physically stand in the location where those individuals had been shot or killed, correct? Yes, several times. I'd like to focus on the first floor. If you could describe to the members of the jury just briefly the names of the individuals that were killed on the first floor. All right, the deceased on the first floor. I'm going to object this to relevance since my client was on the scene at that point. The relevance is? Well, Judge, the relevance is just the order of operations, the timeline that took place, where his client was at what time is pretty relevant. Okay. Over the defense objection. Go ahead, sir. That's what you did. You can answer the question. All right, the first floor. Uh, Coming in through the east side of the 1200 building, first floor, you had uh, Gina Maltalto, Martin Duque, Luke Coyer. Uh, a little further into the first floor was Alex Schachter, Alyssa Alt to death, Helena Ramsey, Nicholas Dorett, Carmen Shentra, uh, Christopher Hickson, which was a staff member and Aaron Feist, who was a staff member. And did you, if I didn't hear, say Elena Petty? Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, Elena Petty. Now, I apologize for that. And as far as processing the crime scene, was there a crime scene tech that was assigned to collect the shell casings and ensure that the scene was properly processed? Yeah, there was nor uh, n uh, numerous crime scene people at the school. Each one, uh, as if I recall correctly, there was teams on each floor assigned each floor. And as the lead detective, are you involved in making sure that that happens in the investigation? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're all, uh, they all have their own supervisors, but ultimately the, the, the homicide lead detective is responsible to make sure everything's done properly. Were you responsible for also, and we won't go through each and indiv individual's name, but were you responsible for also learning the names of those who were wounded but not deceased? Yes. And uh, were there several on the first floor? There was numerous on the first floor. As part of your investigation, did you learn whether any rounds had been shot on the second floor? Yes, when we were able to uh, not only do the physical examination of the second floor, but uh, watching the video as well, you could, on the second floor there were several classrooms that were shot into. And let me back up. Who was the last person to be shot on the first floor? Uh, Coach Aaron Feist. And Coach Aaron Feist, was Coach Aaron Feist shot? Uh, 223-25. And at 223-25, how many times was Aaron Feist shot? Twice in the chest. This film is, uh, is this not even part of the evidence? It is. I apologize, Judge. We're now showing the screen door to the main office. I'm going to turn my screen as well. What's in evidence at State 5. This is the full six hours of surveillance. Of course, Deputy, you didn't call the TVs are off.
that image off to the left where the rifle is being pointed at, which enters into the staircase. And then that door in front of you where you see Nicholas Cruz coming out with the gun leads into the main hallway of the first floor. And it's a mirror image on the east side as well. Um, so if you're standing on the west side of the building, is there a set of doors that will lead you into the hallway and a set of doors that will lead you into the stairwell? Yes. And did you yourself enter this location that we see on this image? You're familiar with this stairwell? Yes. Where was, in reference to the image we're looking at, Aaron Fikes' body found? The doors where the rifle is being pointed, and you see that bright light, uh, he was found right on the concrete patio area where those doors would have opened up into, <laughs> if, as if he was coming into those doors when he was shot. Were crime scene investigators or yourself able to discover whether at the time that he was shot, the doors were open or closed? Um, well, the doors were open because he got shot from Nicholas Cruz was inside the building. He was just making, appeared consistent with him just making entry into the building when he was killed. And at 2.23.26, was this the last killing that takes place on the first floor? Yes. So all of the other deaths that take place happen after 2.23.26? That is correct.
not have it here without my full report, unless you have something you can show me. This 229 sounds correct. You can pull up the video if you need. No, that sounds correct. Okay. So. Hey, I'm going to get 229. Two. We'll just pull up the video, Your Honor. Yeah, the objection is sustained. Go okay. ahead, Ms. Gomez. Ask your next question. Okay. Actually, it's 227.55. It's when the shooter leaves the building or places his gun down? Well, he places his gun on the staircase. Okay. And then and after placing his gun on the staircase, he then goes down the three flights of stairs. Correct? Yeah, I found, I found it in my notes. So. Okay. Yes. All right. And so do you, if you don't know, that's fine. The time that he actually blends in with the students. Uh, he runs for a period of time before he catches up to the hundreds who are pulling westbound. Okay. So, I mean, he takes a few seconds to get there. Okay. So turning your attention to the screen, do you see the three images on the screen? Yes. Describe for the members of the jury where these cameras are located, starting with the camera on the left. Are you familiar with this stairwell? Yes. Did you personally walk this stairwell? Many times. Where is this stairwell in reference to the 1200 building or inside the 1200 building? The picture on the left is coming down from the second floor of the east stairwell. <laughs> down to the first floor, that door that's open on the bottom is um, where Nicholas Cruz first entered into the hallway after loading his gun. And the image in the middle, what, what are we looking at? That's, uh, again, a camera from the actual stair, not stair, the hallway itself shooting um, westbound down the hallway. So this camera is located on the east side of the hallway? Yeah, it's facing, facing from west. the yeah the east door. It's a camera that shoots westbound towards the west door of the first floor. And the image on the right, are you familiar with this camera placement? Yes. Where is this camera placed? That's the uh, location by the 700 building, uh, which is the building just west of the 1200 building. Is this camera angle looking west to east? Uh, I believe it's the opposite. I think it's east to west, but let me, I'd have to actually watch it. <laughs> okay, well, we're going to have to play. Yeah, it, it looks, to me, it looks like it's east to west, but I may be wrong. Yeah, it's definitely, if that right screen is east. Okay. That's Left east. is east. Okay, the right of the screen is east. Yes. Uh, 2.24.03 on all three cameras. Now, the image on the left of the screen, the east stairwell, is that stairwell, let me show you a map. showing what is the free market defense exhibit at. The east stairwell that we just saw on that screen, can you please point, Marcus, point to where that is on this map? Okay. And now, is this, just show the jury, where is north, south, east, and west on this map? Well, north is that way, east is that way, this is where we were at with all the self evacuated students, and this is west going towards where Nicholas Cruz came in. So that stairwell that we just saw, um, Mark, show us one more time. If you know, how far, what is the distance between this east side of the 1200 building and building 
seven. There's seven hundred buildings. So there's seven five feet in, in that range. of your investigation into Nicholas Cruz, were you tasked with speaking with witnesses? Yes. <coughs> Explain the process that you took with the witnesses in this case. Uh, well, one of the things we did, obviously, is we started interviewing people who knew him or had had encounters with him in the past, um, people that uh, were up at the school who potentially uh, had dealt with him on whatever the circumstance was. Uh, any witnesses who came forward to the actual shooting incident themselves, we interviewed. Um, so it, it, the, mo most of the people we interviewed were, were background type uh, witnesses. Did you also interview the fact witnesses that had been on scene at the time of the shooting? Yes. As part of your investigation, did you interview the school resource officer, Scott Peterson? Yes, I did. And what detective assisted you with that interview? Uh, homicide Detective Jeff Curtis. Why did you interview Scott Peterson? He had had dealings with Peterson in the past up at the school, or uh, with Cruz or earlier in, you know, in his career up at the school. Um, and we interviewed other BSO uh, deputies who had had calls of service involving Nicholas Cruz as well. Please uh, walk the jury through the process you took when interviewing Scott Peterson. We were in the conference room, uh, basically took a sworn statement from him with a digital tape recorder, uh, asked him about the day of the incident, and asked him about any past dealings he had ever had with Nicholas Cruz and what, what those entailed. When you're in the interview room, was it made clear that there was a recording device? Yeah, it was right on the table in front. In fact, I, sw I swore him in on, or either I did or Jeff Curtis swore him in under oath. When you say that you swore him in, what does that mean? Uh, basically, it's the oath to swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. It's just a, a formality of, you know, this is what you need to do, tell the truth, and if not, it's, you know, perjury. Did Scott Peterson indicate that he understood he was giving a sworn statement? Yes. Uh, why do you say that? Uh, because again, we, we had the interview and he, the tape recorder is right in front of him and he's, I asked questions, he answered them. When you were interviewing him, was it for matters material to your investigation of the shooter? Yes. And it was under oath you already said, correct? Yes. Okay. Why put a police officer under oath if you're taking a statement from him? Aren't you all? You guys make me swear to my police reports, too. <laughs> we do everything under oath. So even though he was a police officer, you still swore him in like you did the civilian witnesses? Yes, just like you did when I took the stand here. Now, did you ask Deputy Peterson if, you, if he understood what perjury meant when you swore him in? Uh, I'm going to refresh my memory exactly what the wording was. Yeah, I did in his response. Again, I don't know if that's me or Jeff talking, but his response was, I do. Okay. How did Scott Peterson become aware of the fact that something was happening on campus? Uh, he had heard, according to his statement, um, a uh, faculty member named Drew Medina come over the school radio, not, not the police radio, but the school radio, saying something about hearing some sounds, uh, possibly firecrackers, or something to that effect at the 1200 building. Did you confirm with Scott Peterson that he heard that the, the sounds were coming from the 1200 building? Uh, again, I'd have to look at his statement for exact terminology. And I'll refer you to page seven. I mean, Scott Peterson's own words were that Drew, uh, Andrew Medina said 
that he heard firecrackers in the 1200 building. Did the defendant tell you how close he got to the 1200 building? Yes. And what were his words? Uh, he got very close. I think he said within 10 feet. But again, I'd have to look at the exact. So that's what I recall. Yes, yeah, so he got within a few feet. Did he tell you that he heard gunfire? Yes. Did he tell you that he looked inside the building? Um, no, he did not. Did he look in any of the windows? No. Did he tell you that he ever interacted with any students? Uh, as I recall, he said he didn't see anybody coming out of the building. Was the scene that you took of the defendant transcribed? Yes, it was. Can I have this written? You may. Detective, I'm showing what has been pre marked as stage 3A. Can you take a look at this, please? Yep, this is a transcribed copy of the uh, digital sworn statements I took from Scott Peterson. Judge, at this time, the state will bring into evidence what's been pre marked as 3A at stage 52. We objection. We have no objection. Without objection, states 3A for identification will now be in evidence. That is States Exhibit 52. When you said it says 1302 hours, is that military time? Yeah, it's 1, 102, 1, 1 p.m. So what date and time did you take this statement? Uh, February 16th, 2016. That's uh, it's kind of like your badge number, but it's not. It's your ID number that everything, you know, you do work-related, they identify you by your number. Now, this entire transcript is in evidence now, but I'm going to direct your attention to certain pages. Give me just a moment. Started at the highlighted section. The question was, okay, now, as you're approaching the building and you're that close and you're doing what you're talking about with both radios, are you in a position to cover or you're still standing? And he, uh, Mr. Peterson, answer was, no, no, that's where I then realized I'm out in the open in the middle. So I then go back towards the right at the corner of the 7 and 800 building and I go back, I bring green leaf, I, I bring back over here and then I obviously whip out or whip my, whip my gun out 
I'm taking a position on the east side of the doorway and I can also see down the sidewalk looking out west. I get a good, a good two-dimensional of the whole building at that point. <coughs> Want me to continue? Yes, please. Okay, then my question is, okay. well, my, I say okay. So I'm right there, I'm on the radio, I can hear the units coming, uh, and the next thing, while I'm keeping an eye on the door in the building, I don't, no shots, nothing anymore, it's quiet. And then my question, okay, so you're right here is what you're saying. We had a little map that was pointing things out. And then his answer, yes, I'm right. I'm looking out so I can see the door and I can see out here. I, I, I got a good look or I got a good. Okay, do you see any students or any people around the 12 Hender building at that point? And his answer was no, nobody. Thank you for your attention to page 12 to 36. Okay. And I'll ask you to read starting with the highlighted portion. All right, we're, we're discussing Coral Springs Officer Burton in this section, and, and the question is, all right, what happens from there? Scott Peterson's answer was, and he runs up by the tree, and I'm just telling him, you know, I heard, I heard a couple of shots, haven't heard anything since, and he's just taking cover by, you know, behind the tree, and I'm taking cover here, and units are now starting, you know, no more gunshots, and units are starting to come in. And then my question is, okay, as the units start to come in, what do you see and what do you do? Um, and then the answer by Scott Peterson was, well, as the units start coming in, the first units are coming in saying, hey, there's someone shot over by the football field. You know, I know where the football field is. It's quite a distance from this building. So when I start hearing they talk about the victim over by the football field, in my mind, I was kind of, is he maybe running towards that? Maybe he's not even in this building. He might be somewhere way out over there. I mean, in my mind, I obviously didn't know, you know, where the shooter was. And then I started wondering if he had fled westbound at that point because they were talking about people injured near the football field which is quite a distance from the building. Okay. Want me to continue? I'll direct you to the next one. No problem. Directing you to page 14. Well, I, you know, again, we use the word active intelligence to try to figure out what's going on. Active intelligence goes beyond hearing gunshots. It's everything from seeing casings to a blood trail to getting information from people as to what's going on. That's the, those are all the term active intelligence. So um, just like I was trying to do interviewing all those students, I was asking him if he got any active intelligence by talking to anybody. Okay. And the highlighted question and answer, please. Actually, if you could start right above it. Did you go in the 12 at all? No, because no. Question, okay, now did you ever see, you know, while everybody is starting to arrive, did you ever see any of the students leaving Building 12 at all? Yes. Question, which? Which were they, all the doors or? No, they were evacuating. They were telling them to... They were taking them out and they were, the kids were going out towards the parking lot. Okay, that's when the officers arrived, when the officers arrived. But 
you didn't see any kids. No, when I was on the scene, there were no individuals running out, none. Did you confirm, oh, sorry, keep going. Okay, so their question is, okay, so there was, there was no kids that ran out to say to you guys, hey, there's a guy up there or anything like that, and his answer was no. Okay, now, did you confirm, when you're, when you're taking this statement, have you already reviewed the surveillance cameras? The only video we had reviewed at that point was the interior of the 1200 building. The exterior, we had not viewed yet because it had uh, been taken to uh, another site. So when I was taking the statement, I had not seen any of the exterior videos at all. So is the point of this statement just to gather whatever information he may have had from the scene that day? Not only from the scene, but background about his interactions with Nicholas Cruz in the past. That's a standard question I ask anybody I'm interviewing. Is there anything else that I failed to ask you that you feel is important or relevant, you know, again, that I haven't asked you? So that wasn't something unique to this interview? Every, every interview I do, I, I, I try to incorporate that because, again, it, you know, I'm asking the questions, but is there something I haven't asked you that's important that I need to know? on page 10. It wasn't many, two, three. Detective Crisco, how many rounds in total were fired inside the 1200 building? I'd have to look to make sure. Let's see. I believe it was uh, over 130. 131, I believe. So over 130? Yes. And how many rounds in total between the second and the third floor from that time after Aaron Price is shot onward? 70. Now I asked you the names, well you did, you provided us with the names of Lulu and you as well on the third floor. Yeah. Okay, just a moment to confer your honor.
invite you to take 14 or 30 steps. Okay, so there was there was no kids that ran out to say to you, you guys, hey, there's a guy up there or anything of that, and, and the answer was no. Next question. A question, you didn't see any kids until police started being evacuated by the police, and then his response was yes. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, Detective. Sir. You and I have met during deposition, correct? Yes. In fact, there were three separate days that we conducted the deposition back in 2021, correct? I don't remember the exact date, but there was two and a half days worth of deposition, yes. Okay. And you understood at that time that all your answers would be memorialized in a transcript, correct? Yes. And you rose your right hand to sort of tell the truth the same way you are now, correct? Yes. And we went over the details of your investigation into the Nicholas Cruz case, correct? Um, I'm sure we went into some part of it, yes. I don't okay. know if we went into the full details of it. And we also talked about your involvement in this particular case, correct? Yes. Right. You remember the prosecutor asking you about the kids and adults who were shot on the first floor of the 1200 building, correct? Yes. Without question, my client wasn't even at the scene when those shootings took place, isn't that correct? No, he was on the scene when Aaron Feist got shot. Got it. Except for Aaron Feist in the stairwell on the first floor. Other than that, my client was not even there when those kids were, were not, killed. Not based on the video timeline. He okay. was approaching the building. So there's nothing he could have physically done to prevent their tragic demise. Isn't that correct, sir? Uh, I disagree on Chris Hickson. Okay. So we'll talk about the first shots that were fired in the stairwell. Remember when the prosecutor asked you about that? That was at 223.55, correct? I'm sorry, 223.25, isn't that correct? Okay, so the first shots when Luke Hoyer and you talk about those, is that? I'm referring to when Aaron Feist okay. was shot at 223.25, correct? Okay. Yes. And one second after that, you are aware that that's when my client announces shots fired, possible firecrackers, possible shots fired. Remember that? I don't remember the exact terminology. That sounds accurate based and, on the timeline. Yes. And that was one second after Aaron Feist was shot at 223.25. Isn't that correct, sir? Yes. And when Aaron Feist was shot, the door was open. The door to the stairwell was open. Isn't that correct? That's what it appeared to be. And Aaron Feist was on the opposite side of the door, correct? He was, in my opinion, making entry when he was shot. He fell backwards. Uh, outside the door. Let me show you what is in evidence as defense exhibit number one. And if you could show us where Aaron Feist's body was found. You just point to it, please. This area here. This is where he was. Okay, you pointed up at the column. It was actually down on the concrete ground, correct? Yeah, again, the body was moved, but it was down towards this area. Okay, are you showing us that it was outside of this door? Yeah, he fell outside the door. Okay. The door was open and he fell backwards. Now that shot was different than the other shots fired in that there was no door that was open when the other shots were fired, correct? That's correct. And then after Aaron Feist was shot. There are no additional shots for another 26 seconds. Isn't that correct? I have to look at the timeline. That sounds accurate. 
because the next round of shots into 1231 was at 22351. Isn't that correct? Council's testifying. No, that's over. You can answer. Again, I'd have to look at the timeline for the exact times. He goes up to the second floor and he shoots the six rounds into the building. I don't remember the exact seconds, but it's all on a timeline. Okay. And that would have been north. His, the shooter would be have pointing his weapon north into room 1231. Isn't that correct? Well, again, the, the building's kind of oriented, so he, he would have been firing westbound uh, kind of into those second floor building uh, classrooms where no one was hit because the, the rounds uh, impacted the window on the west side of the 1200 building. We're talking about the second floor, right? We're talking about the second floor. The round of gunfire into 1234, for example, would have been in the direction of my client, correct? Yes. And would have... But that's west, kind of westbound. Well, it's, it's, I'll go northwest with you, but it's, it's west. He would, Cruz would have been firing westbound. You're certain of that? The 700 building is west of the 1200 building. If, if the football field is west, that's northwest, yes. Okay. And my client would have been positioned south West. of the 1200 building, correct? No, he's directly across from the 1200 building and the 700 building. Doesn't that put him south, sir? It's kind of southwest. The, the building is not exactly north south, it's kind of on an angle. My client's on the east side of the 1200 building, further south, correct? No. He's on the west side of the 1200 building. The 1200 building is the furthest uh, east building. So he's west of the 1200 building. Is your testimony that my client was on the west side of the 1200 building or the east side? He was at the 700 building, which is on the west side of the 1200 building. It's the building west of the 1200 building. I mean, we're going to put the map up. I'll show you. The 1200 building is the, the, the furthest east building of the campus. Okay, if this is the 700 building. Yeah, this is going west. So your client was west of the 1200 building. You're saying that this is west? Isn't the football field west? Okay, so the 1200 building, this, yeah, well, yeah, this is where he was standing. So this is west. This whole area is west. This is east. The football field is west. Of that's the that's so northwest. This is southwest. And my client was over here, correct? Yes. So this would have put him south of the 1200 building, correct? And west of the 1200 building. Westbound. I mean, if, we, can, we can argue with it. I mean, it's not east because east is this way. If he's positioned over here, mm -hmm. you're saying that this is west of the 1200 building? No objection. I'm saying it's south no, hold west. On. The, the objections are overruled. Go ahead, so you can That's your testimony. Okay. Well, Regardless, yeah. though, my client could not have seen what was occurring on the west side of the 1200 building. Isn't that correct? That's, that was the point of that? Yes, you're correct. And so Aaron Feist being shot, my client couldn't physically have seen that, correct? No. And this building, the 1200 building, is 73 yards long. Isn't that correct? That sounds accurate. So my client would have been at least 73 yards away from where Aaron Feist was shot. Isn't that correct? Yes. And Aaron Feist was shot on the west side with the door, the west side door open. Correct? Yes. And the total amount of time that the shooter was in that building was 6 minutes and 36 seconds. Isn't that correct? That sounds accurate, yes. But my client wasn't there until the last 4 minutes and 15 seconds. Isn't that correct? Yes. So the total time that my client has to react, identify where the shooter or shooters are located, get in there and kill the killer would have been merely 4 minutes and 15 seconds. Isn't that correct? Well, again, you're using the term kill the killer. I wouldn't use that term. Your, your time frame is correct. Okay. But the, the action, I kind of disagree with what you're saying the action would have been. Okay. The total time that my client had to confront whoever was creating this massacre would have been four minutes and 15 seconds, correct? That's correct. And by the way, let me show you what's been marked as <coughs> defense exhibit, looks like, uh, let's see, okay. Let me show you and ask you if you recognize 
who's containing this photograph. What is the, is it the marker? It, it looks like an L judge or a C. I'm not sure. I'm showing what's been marked as defense exhibit L. Do you recognize who's contained in that photo? Yep. Okay, is that fair? Who, who, who is that? Uh, Nicholas Jacob Cruz. Okay, does this fairly and accurately identify Nicholas Jacob Cruz? Yes. Okay, Judge, we move this into evidence. Any objection? Noted. Without objection, defense L for identification will now be in evidence. That is defense exhibit three. Judge, if I can have a motion. As soon as Matt can be full cut mark. That's Nicholas Cruz, isn't it? Yes, it is. Is that the person responsible for killing all those people? Yes, he is. And you were the lead investigator in this case, correct? Yes, I was. He had nobody else with him, correct? No, he did not. But at the time, you didn't know, correct, when you arrived on scene? No. In fact, none of the officers that worked for BSO would have known that there was just one shooter on campus, correct? That's correct. <clears throat> Your role is not as the lead investigator in the case against Scott Peterson, correct? No, it is not. You are the lead investigator in the state of Florida versus Nicholas Cruz, correct? I was, yes. That case is over with, correct? Yes. And the way that it worked in that case is that you conducted a very professional and thorough investigation, did you not? I don't know if that's a statement or a question. I would like to believe I did, but... Yeah, no, it is. It's a statement. Do you agree with that? I did an investigation that uh, culminated in him pleading guilty to 17 counts of murder and 17 counts of attempted murder. And the investigation was extensive over many, many years even, correct? That, that is correct. And during that time, you interview numerous witnesses, correct? Yes. You take sworn statements from hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of witnesses, correct? Uh, not so much hundreds on this case, but in, in my career, yes, hundreds of witnesses. Okay. And you have pages of reports, correct? On this case, yes. And when we say on this case, we're referring to Nicholas Cruz, correct? Yes. Okay, that's what we're talking about right now. Okay. I just want to know what your role was in Nicholas Cruz and what a lead investigator does in a case, right? Yes. And you don't determine what charges get filed, correct? No, we, uh, well, in this case, we charge them with a probable cause affidavit. This you keep saying in this case. Uh, we're referring to Nicholas Cruz, okay. correct? So in, I'm just asking you, ultimately, a prosecutor in the Nicholas Cruz case makes the determination what charges should be filed, Objection. correct? The prosecutor doesn't investigate the case. That's your job, correct? Objection relevance. No, that's a rule. Go ahead, sir. You can answer that question. Yes, but in that case, it was presented to a grand jury, and then the state attorney, obviously, um, from there took over. In cases where there's no grand jury, you do an investigation, correct? Yes, yes. You present your reports to the prosecutor, correct? Yes. And it's important that those reports are very accurate and detailed, correct? Yes. In for, for two primary purposes. Number one, you have to rely upon the accuracy of those reports years later when you testify, correct? Yes. And you often refresh your recollection utilizing those reports, correct? Yes. But also because you're submitting reports to a prosecutor for them to determine what the facts are, correct? Well, the report is based on statements, so they have both the statements and the report to rely on. 
And then based upon what's submitted to the prosecutor, the prosecutor decides what might the, the appropriate charges be, correct? Yes. Yeah, that's the same. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Your Honor. And you were not the lead investigator in this case. That was Keith Riddick. Is that correct? That is correct. <clears throat> now, regarding the shooting, you weren't there when any of the gunshots rang out, correct? That is correct. You have no first-hand knowledge of how challenging it was to determine precisely where the shooters were located based upon the sound, correct? I would say in, in this case, that's correct. You must have spoken, well, let me ask you, did you interview any witnesses who heard shots being fired to find out where they thought those shots were coming from? In reference to my investigation, I interviewed some of them. A lot of them were interviewed by Keith Riddick, but yes, I interviewed some of them. Okay. And did you ever supply any of those names to Keith Riddick? Uh, yes. And in those statements, you would have identified where they were positioned, correct? Yes. And where they thought the shots might have been coming from, correct? Yes. And you thought that was being of service to Keith Riddick, so he can include that as part of the case against Scott Peterson, correct? Again, when I would come upon somebody, I, on my case that I was interviewing, if it crossed over into what Keith Riddick was investigating, I would say, in particular, this is a guy, have you interviewed him yet? If not, you need to. Did you, through your investigation, ever compile a list of all of the hundreds of students who were coming out of the building to determine where they were when the shots rang out and where they thought the shots were coming from? What we did, and this is going to be somewhat of a long answer, since we self, or we evacuated the entire school, we had to get in contact with everybody who was on campus that day to find out if they heard shots or what they saw. And it wasn't just me doing it, it was hundreds of detectives from every agency. If they heard or saw something of relevance, it was then funneled back to us. If they didn't, if they were like in the, whatever, 800 building and they didn't see or hear anything, then they were not provided, I didn't get their names, they were just documented by the agency. Is, is it your testimony that you spoke or had someone speak to every one of the, let's say, thousand of kids that were both in the 700 building and the neighboring buildings that came out during the fire alarm? We split up the school roster of not only staff members but students, um, and when I say we, I'm talking about the sheriff's office, and detectives contacted, they had like 25 on a, on a sheet, and they were supposed to contact every one of them to find out if they had any relevant information toward the investigation. Where are those sheets? They're in the case file. But anybody who had significant information then was funneled back to a detective to be formally interviewed. If they, okay. if they just hid in the auditorium and they didn't see or hear well, anything, course. then they were not funneled back to us. I'm referring to kids who came out of these buildings and heard shots fired. Where are those? Those notes are in the case file? No. The, again, the, what I'm telling you is everybody who was on campus was recontacted because we had sent everybody potentially running off campus. The investigation that you're talking about is Keith Riddick's files. Right. Okay. I mean, if I had a crossover witness. Fair enough. I understand that you're not the lead on this case. But, so it's Keith Riddick who would have been responsible for what you're talking about, correct? If I can, can I give you a very short example of I what? I just want to know if, if the answer is yes or no. It would have been Keith Riddick responsible for that, not you, correct? Keith Riddick was responsible for the investigation about the police response, not just Scott Peterson, but any police response. Mine was Nicholas Cruz. I understand, but Keith Riddick is the sole lead investigator in the case against Scott Peterson. Yes or no? Yes. Okay. Now, when you arrived on scene, did you know that Carl Springs had a separate 911 call center? No, I did not. You learned that after the fact, right? Yes. Did you think when you arrived that when people were calling in to 911 saying there's a shooter in the 1200 building and kids are being killed, that somehow that information was being disseminated to BSO? 
again, when I'm on scene, I didn't know that even existed. Obviously, afterwards, I, I, I learned about that issue. Also, in terms of patching, did you think that Coral Springs Radio would have been patched with BSO so that they could be working in concert together? That's a normal protocol when, when you have agencies that are not a part of the BSO right. uh, radio system. It's normal protocol, but it was protocol that you learned was not followed in this case, correct? I think it was attempted, but because of the radio problems that day, on both ends, they weren't able to accomplish it. They, I think they tried to patch, but our, the BSO radio system uh, was failing based on how many radios were trying to key up at the same time, where you would, you would I don't even know what the term is anymore, it would go into fail soft mode, where you, you couldn't transmit and couldn't hear it. How fair is that to officers who are on the scene? I, I was one of the officers on the scene. I mean, I don't know what, what, how fair it is. That's just what happened. It's just the way, it, it, unfortunately, uh, the way it happened that day. When you say unfortunate, why is it unfortunate? Because, again, you're trying to gather uh, real-time intelligence, and as police officers in the modern era, we rely on our radios. Right. And to get communications from people who are, who have the best real-time intelligence, and in this case, because the radios failed, uh, that was a difficult task. Impossible for some who would try to get on their radios and it would throttle, correct? Yes. Explain to the jurors what would happen if someone had some important real-time intelligence to convey to my client or other officers on the scene. Tell us what would happen. Again, the, the technology is well beyond my, my expertise, but if you try to transmit, it would make this alarming, boinking sound, which meant it wasn't coming over because there were just too many people trying to either transmit or, or they were flooding. There's only so many slots that you can get on the radio system, and once that overfills, it goes into fail-safe or fail-soft mode. <coughs> And so first responders, you would agree, were grossly hindered by the fact that the radios were not working properly, correct? I would say that's accurate. The fact that the radios with Coral Springs were not patched, correct? Uh, yes. And that nobody from Coral Springs called BSO dispatch to say, hey, here's some information you might want to convey to your officers, correct? Um, I know they tried to transfer some 911 calls and... and in some cases that failed as well because Coral Springs was getting the 911 calls from in some cases inside the building and when they would try to transfer them to BSO the, the, the transfers weren't going through. And so all that information was never conveyed to BSO officers like my client, isn't that correct? Um, no, it was a transfer. It wasn't given over the radio at all that I can recall. And there's no question through your investigation, you learned that there were numerous children calling in from the 1200 building, indicating exactly where the shooter was located, correct? Children and teachers. And that went to Carl Springs, not BSO, isn't that correct? That is absolutely correct. You agree that that is unacceptable, correct? Objection, Judge. Yeah, but that's the same. That is not how you guys were trained, correct? I would say it's not optimum because it's not the way we're trained. It's just the fact that if you're responding to an incident, again, you're trying to get real-time intelligence by whatever means you can, and a 911 call from inside the building is real-time intelligence. When you arrived on scene, I think you testified earlier that a lieutenant colonel told you that someone was shot, correct? No, that was while I was at the public safety building. Okay. That information never came out over your BSO radio, correct? I think that may have been one of the guys on Holmberg actually saying he had a guy shot at the football field, which was Mr. Lamont. Th that is correct. Football field. Did you hear that announcement saying that somebody was on the football field being shot? 
Well, when a lieutenant colonel came running in, he didn't say football field. He just said there was a student shot and there was a shooting at the school. My, my question is, did you hear Deputy Kratz announce in real time that the shots were coming from the football field? I didn't the day of the incident. I heard it afterwards while I was doing my investigation. And just so we're clear, that when Deputy Kratz makes that announcement during the shooting, the shooter was in the middle of the third floor, correct? Do you match that up? Uh, I don't know if he was in the middle. I think he was in the teacher's planning room, I believe. He had not gotten to the teacher's planning room. Isn't that correct? I'd have to look at the timeline. I just know he was on the third floor. That's correct. Now, you told the prosecutor that the purpose of your interview with my client was to find out more about Nicholas Cruz. That's what you said, correct? Well, that was part of it. I mean, right. So tell the jurors the other part of it, sir. The part of it, which is the beginning stages, is what he saw, your client, or what he heard that day. Just so where he was at. Just so we're clear, this is not a formal debriefing as required by the active shooter policy, correct? That wasn't your purpose. No, I'm, I'm a homicide detective. I don't do formal debriefings. Got it. You're aware that the active shooter policy requires timely debriefings of officers. You're aware of that, correct? I'd have to read it again, but uh, that sounds accurate. Just so we're clear, a debriefing is when you get into detail with someone to learn exactly what they know, what they feel, what they think, correct? Uh, a debriefing, in my opinion, is so you can review what happened to make things better if there was an issue. That was not your purpose, correct? No, I was a, a homicide investigator in charge of the investigation of the, the, the killings. And, and isn't it a fact that this interview actually happened because, first of all, Brian Tutler and Zach Scott were liaisons to the families, correct? That's correct. And family members started asking where Peterson was during the shooting, correct? Objection. Yes. Yeah. Well, can we pause and on the objection? Because we're over for a restroom break anyway. So ladies and gentlemen, we're going to pause on the cross-examination. I'm going to give you a real quick restroom break. Same admonition as always. Please don't discuss the facts of the case, the evidence, the witnesses, or the testimony. Outside the presence of the jury, everyone can be seated. Ms. Combs, what's your legal objection? Judge, the, the it, well, it's hearsay, first of all, as to what these other men, I think their names were Zach. I don't know who these other names were, but also it's irrelevant as to the motivations behind. The, the question to the witness was, isn't it true that Terrence made certain statements out of court that are not to this witness? So why is that not hearsay? Judge, first of all, it's impeachment. His answer was, the only reason why I conducted this interview was to, quote, find out about Nicholas Cruz. To impeach him, first and foremost, his testimony and deposition is that they were there to find out what occurred because the family members started asking where Peterson was during the shooting, and that then his sergeant said, we then need to interview Peterson, and that's when they went to the public safety building for sworn, the sworn statement. Okay, so then what, again, we've had this discussion before, what is the relevance for this jury as to why? At a minimum, it's impeachment, Judge. He said that the purpose was for one thing, but there actually is sworn testimony, and he began to concede that there was another purpose as to why it was. So are you saying it's not hearsay because you're using it for impeachment purposes? I'm saying it goes to, it's not hearsay because it goes to state of mind. Why did he conduct this? Isn't it not being offered for the truth? You, you're asserting that that actually happened, right? So no. It's not a court statement being asserted for the truth of the matter. It, it goes to his state of mind. Who's state? This witness's why state, of mind state of mind as to why. why what this jury has to decide. Again, I'm going to let you do a proffer outside of the presence of the jury when we're done with all this, but this is inerse to the discussion that we've had several times before. It, this jury isn't going to be asked to decide why charges were filed or what the reason charges were filed. The only decision they have to make is, has the state proven beyond a reasonable doubt each element of the crimes charged? The reason that the charges were filed is not in the purview of the jury, and I'm going to sustain the state's objection. I'm not going to let you 
Your Honor, it's impeachment. The, the, the officer testified the sole reason was to find out about Nicholas Cruz. I can't bring no, up. That's not what he said. No, he said, not. He, oh, hold on, sir. Hold on. Sorry. Uh, you want me to leave, Your Honor? Uh, if you would like to step down and use yeah, the you just can't talk to anyone about your testimony. He, he left uh, off the other. Stand. He left off the other portion, Judge. That he's asked by family members. I, I disagree with you, sir. He said you asked him that last question. He said it was two reasons. Number one, I was a homicide detective for Nicholas Cruz. Number two, I wanted to find out what Mr. Peterson. Right. He said. left. He left out the other reason. That doesn't matter. Right. Okay. Yeah, I know you don't agree with my right. ruling, sir, but it doesn't matter. Then note my objection for the record, okay? And, and if you're sustaining the objection, again, I'm, I'm, I'm... No, I'm gonna, when we're done with redirect examination, if there is any, with new cross, if there is any, I'll send the jury out again, and you may make your record and ask the detective whatever you would like to ask to, uh, as a proffer. Yeah, and Judge, as I've let you get the, the state was the one who asked him what his reasons were for doing, and he left out the primary reason why he did this, which is what he tells us in deposition. In deposition, he said the primary reason is because the families wanted to know where Peterson was at. And I'm not allowed to bring that out in front of the jury? Okay, so not my objection. Nope. State, anything else you need to do with this? No, Judge. All right, real quick, five minutes of rest. We break, we'll be in recess for five minutes. <coughs>
little fancy corn. They don't even have a clock. Okay, I'm going to go back on the record. This is uh, State versus Scott Peterson, 197166CF10A. I continue to have Ms. Combs, Mr. Cho, and Mr. Klinger are present for the state. I continue to have Mr. Aguilar present with Mr. Peterson, who likewise is present. We are outside the presence of the jury. The witness remains on the witness stand. State anything you need to address before we bring the jury back in. No, Judge. Defense anything you need me to address before we bring the jury back in. No, Your Honor. Okay, please bring the jury back. the interview of my client, there was no pending criminal investigation, correct? Against your client? Yeah. No. There wasn't even an internal affairs investigation, correct? No, there was not. There had not been any, at that point, any public outcry at all. Objection. There had not been any public outcry to place my client in any headspace that there was something that anybody was thinking that he did wrong, correct? It would be objection there. as to the relevance. Yeah, that's the same. Yes, we have to have one more.
client didn't come with, with a lawyer, correct? That's correct. He didn't have the benefit of reviewing any reports before he gave his statement, correct? Uh, the only thing he brought was some paperwork that he had on Nicholas Cruz from the school. That's it. But nothing regarding, you know, anything else, correct? Well, I think one of them was an official report that he had been involved in with Nicholas Cruz, but that's the only report I remember. Okay. But not my investigation, none of my reports were offered here. Correct. So he had no reports yet regarding what happened on the day in question, correct? No. Nor, nor was he given the opportunity to review any videos, correct? No. So he comes in there and he answered every single one of your questions, correct? Um, I believe so, yeah, I'd have to go back and look. I don't remember any he couldn't answer. In other words, he didn't refuse to answer any questions, oh, no. correct? No, he did not. And you've been in law enforcement for decades. You've become a pretty good judge of character as to whether you're seeing somebody who outright looks like they're lying to you, correct? Ask it again so I get the specifics. For decades, you've been interviewing people, right? 40, you generally years. can get a sense when somebody is lying to you, correct? What I end up doing is I listen to what people say and then right. I evaluate through an investigation whether or not. I try not to be so open minded that, you know, I believe I'm clairvoyant and I can tell if somebody's telling the truth. At no point while you're speaking with my client for the time that he was with you, did you think right then and there, gosh, this guy's lying to me the way that he's speaking to me. Correct? Objection, Your Honor. Yeah, that makes sense. You tell my client that you're conducting this interview in a chronological order, correct? Yes. And that means you go from the beginning and then you say, and then what happened after that, correct? Well, it's got a reverse chronological from the day of the shooting, then backwards with Nicholas Cruz background. That's correct. This, the interview that you conducted of Nicholas Cruz, which lasted for hours, how long was that transcript? How many pages? I have no idea. I mean, hundreds, correct? Again, I have no idea. This was merely 36 pages, correct? Yes. And up to page 16 is all that you discuss about what happened that day, correct? Um, yeah, it looks like 15, 16 words. We start going into the background. Right. So from page 17 on, all the way to the end, there's no discussion at all about what happened on the day of the shooting, correct? Uh, towards the end, when I make that comment, is there anything else about the day of the shooting or? Other than that one question, there's nothing from page 17 to 36 where you discuss any further details about what occurred on the day of the shooting. Isn't that correct, sir? Um, not particularly that I can recall, but I'd have to read every page. I know, I know we talked about the fire alarm and protocol and what to do a fire alarm versus an active shooter situation, but that was more a general question right. rather than the day of the incident. In, in fact, at the top of page 17, you say, you start off with, Cruz, all right, how long have you known Nicholas Cruz? Yes. You, you shift your discussion to him, correct? Yes. Okay, so let's focus on the first 16 pages, okay? Okay. And one of the first things that he tells you is that prior to hearing the fire alarm, Scott was in his office researching a statute concerning a student who had a fake driver's license. Isn't that correct? What page are you at, just so I can refresh my memory? I know he said he was doing some fraudulent driver's license investigation. Okay, you remember that, correct? Yeah. It, in your research, did you find that that was a, the truth or a lie? Objection, Your Honor. Did he tell you that the student's father was coming to the campus and he was going to meet with him? Do you remember him telling you that? I'd have to look at the page. That sounds accurate, but if you have the page number, I can refresh my memory as we go. Okay. My question is, do you remember him telling you that? Somewhat, yes. Okay. I think he said when? something. Maybe he may have contacted him on the phone uh, is the way I remember it. But uh -huh. that's and 
he tells you that he was in building one prior to the fire alarm going off, correct? Yeah, I believe he said he was in his office, which is in building one. Okay. And that is quite a distance from the 1200 building, isn't that correct? It's probably two buildings. And when he tells you that he was in the administrative office in building one, you were able to confirm that by watching the video, correct? He was near the, the 100 building. He was not, as I recall, he was not in it. He was down towards, uh, I think it was the cafeteria down there, that area. Is it your statement that he wasn't in the 100 building and then went out of the 100 building? I just remember him being in the hallway. Okay. Uh, and as he approached going to the 1200 building, there's a golf cart which would have been in front of his, where his offices were, but he was not in that office. And when he tells you that he got up, that Andrew Medina drove him and Greenleaf to the 1200 building, you confirmed that on the video, correct? Again, you, you have the page number. I know that's what happened based on the video. Okay. I don't recall him actually saying that. Someone could I know be, he said he, he, he didn't see the golf cart originally that he normally gets on. That's correct. Somebody could be inaccurate, but not necessarily be a liar, correct? Sure. In other words, if he tells you that he didn't see someone leaving the 1200 building during the shooting, that doesn't necessarily mean that he's lying about it, correct? Objection, speculation, and opinion. Yeah, that's the thing with the book. Are, are you familiar with something called tunnel vision? Yes. Tell the jurors what tunnel vision is. Tunnel vision, and again, this is my interpretation of it, is usually when you're involved in an encounter where you're personally under stress, as in a policeman where you're being fired upon, where your vision becomes tunneled, where you don't see outside that, quote, tunnel. Okay. And so, in other words, things could be blocked in the periphery because you're focused, laser focused on something right ahead of you, correct? That's the term tunnel vision, yes. And you're familiar with the fact that a number of officers were going through tunnel vision while they're at the scene because this was very stressful, correct? Well, no, that's a rule, but I don't want you to guess that if you have personal knowledge, you can answer the question. Uh, unless you can show me a statement that, that says that, I don't recall anybody saying that to me personally. Okay. And what about auditory exclusion? Are you familiar with that? Uh, yeah, I've heard the term as well. Okay. Tell the jurors what auditory exclusion is. That you, again, under my terminology is you're the officer being fired upon. Sometimes you may not hear... Um, Certain, certain things that are occurring. There are a lot of people who didn't hear all of the shots fired, correct? Objection, relevance, and jury trial. It's a statement that's a hearsay. Did you interview people to determine how many shots they heard? Uh, yes. Did anybody say they heard all 140 some odd shots? You are familiar with the fact that the students on the third floor didn't even hear the shots on the first floor, correct? Objection call for hearsay. Yeah, that's the same. Did you watch the video of the students coming out into the third floor? Yes. Did you know what their demeanor appeared like? Um, yes. That demeanor changed from calm, did it not? There's, there's so many different students. Some of them went from calm to panic, yes. Okay. And that panic occurred because the shooter went on to the third floor and began shooting, correct? Objection, lack of personal knowledge. Yeah, that's the same. Now, when you ask my client about how many shots he heard, there's one question that deals with that. Isn't that correct? Uh, there's one question, but multiple answers during the statement. He, he talks about how many shots he heard really? after I asked that question. Well, it, it's in evidence, so let's, let's talk about it. Judge, if I can okay. get this on, please. Page nine. You agree on page nine, at the very bottom. Mm -hmm. This is the first time you ask him 
the question all the way at the bottom. This is the first time that you ask him about how many shots he hears. Isn't that correct? No, but he answers above the, on, from the bottom where he hears the gunfire, but I ask him the amount on the bottom. Of the okay, case. so the first time you ask him about the amount, and the only time you ask him about the amount, correct? Yes. All right, so that question is, okay, you say, okay, all right. Once you uh, get closer and you hear those guys, w w what guys were you referring to? Again, I don't know what the guys refer to. I'd have to make sure it's an accurate transcription, which I believe it is, but I don't, I don't recall what guys. Did you, I, have, an, did you have an answer? I, did, I just did answer it. You want me to repeat it? I don't know what the guys refers to, so I'd have to make sure I'm listening to the actual audio statement and it's accurate, but I don't remember what guys it was. Those are your words. So that, that's the transcription of what I asked, but the best evidence is the actual audio recording. So, so I have to you, listen to the audio recording. As you sit here today, you don't know what you what guys you're referring to? That's what I just answered. Yeah, I'd have to listen to the audio recording. You do say, all right, okay. You uh, you get closer, and you hear those guys. Mm -hmm. How many rounds do you think you heard? Yes. And his answer is, it wasn't many, two or three. That was his response, correct? Yes. And isn't it a fact that two or three is the exact number of shots that went into Aaron Feist? Isn't that correct? Two went into Aaron Price, yes. Okay, so that was accurate. If he's referring to when he arrives at the building and he hears the shots fired, two would have been accurate, correct? Objection, counsel testifying as to what is accurate and what is inaccurate. Yeah, that's the same. So this is the only time in this deposition, strike that, this is the only time in this statement that you ask him how many shots that he heard, correct? So the time I asked how many shots, yes. Isn't it a fact that at no time do you say, how many total shots did you hear from the time that you arrived to the time that you hear no longer any shooting? No, I did not use the word totally. Uh, again, he talked about it later in his statement to clarify what he was telling me. Is it your testimony that at no time do you ever think to say how many total shots did you hear? It was very clear from my question to him and his answers to me what we were talking about is he only heard two to three shots. But then the very thing that he said that you say after he says it wasn't many two to three the next question you say is okay all right what happens from there right yes you weren't asking total number of shots you were saying at that point when you're by the building is that what you were referring to absolutely not we're talking about shots being fired what he heard because a little further down, he actually clarifies it again. In retrospect, do you think that asking how many total shots fired would make it clear for everyone? No, because I, again, think it was very clear in the interview what I was asking, and based on his answers several times during the statement, it was very clear he understood what my question was. You've read the dispatch transcript to know exactly what my client was saying in real time, correct? Yes. He initially reports shots fired at 2.23.26, correct? I'd have to see the timeline on the time, but that sounds accurate. You do remember him 
again saying additionally, when there are additional shots fired, he gets on the radio and he does announce shots fired, correct? Yes, and I believe you can actually hear the shots going off. Did you ever, as part of your investigation, ever speak to Anna Ramos? The name sounds familiar. I have to look at my reports. I believe so. Jeffrey Morford. Yes. To confirm that they heard my client order a code red. The police response part of the investigation was not conducted by me, but I, whether I asked them that, I have to look at the statements. In, it may have been in a statement somebody else took as part of the secondary investigation of your client and yeah. the other responding deputies. I want to cover some more of the statements. My client is doing a diagram for you, correct? Uh, I believe we had a, a map of the school. And he was trying to assist you by drawing things out, correct? Uh, yes, or pointing out with his finger. That wasn't included in this packet, correct? The, the state brought, no, I don't know, I didn't see it in the evidence. Okay, so. it, it's not, can you just take a look? That drawing that he did, that's not part of what's in evidence there, correct? Well, again, I recall it being a map. I don't want to refer to it as a drawing, but no, it's not in evidence. Do you believe that he was assisting you as he was drawing for you? Uh, he was helping clarify certain things, mm -hmm. uh, you know, at the school locations. My client gave you the name of the student that he was investigating who possessed the counterfeit license, correct? Yes. Did you investigate to determine whether that was accurate? Again, that would have been part of the other response uh, investigation by uh, Inspector Riddick. Once I took this statement and the uh, outside video uh, came back from Quantico, mm -hmm. I had no further follow-up on that type of it's an investigation. He does give you her name, Marisol West, correct? Yes. Now, two days after the shooting, my client is telling you that he thought the shots were outside of the 1200 building, correct? I think he made some, and I had to look at the page, he said it was really close. Yeah. That those, those shots seemed like they were outside. Okay. And that was the two to three he was referring to. He did tell you it was very loud, correct? Yes. He tells you that he got about 10 feet from the building, correct? Yes. And that's when he heard the gunfire, correct? I believe that's accurate, yes. He tells you that he didn't get the opportunity to actually open up the door before he hears the gunfire, correct? I don't remember that exact terminology, but I don't think he said anything about opening the door, no. You ask him specifically if he saw any muzzle flashes, correct? Yes. And he tells you, no, he didn't, correct? That's correct. Was there any evidence that you discovered of any muzzle flashes that were visible to anybody um, watching the building when the shooter was on the second or third floor? Uh, the only evidence that I had which prompted that question was uh, the impact to the second floor windows. So that's why that prompted that question. Okay. And he 
tells you that he locked down the campus. He didn't want anybody coming onto the campus, correct? Uh, yes, that, that's what he did. Did he indicate to you it's because he felt that it would be unsafe for people to tra traverse in that area? I'd have to look at exactly why he did that, but that's what he did. You're trained also to keep people out of a crime scene, correct? Once the crime scene is secure, yes. Okay. He tells you that he's speaking on both of his radios, the school and the police radio, correct? Yes. And he indicates to you that after he announces the code red and the shots are fired, he realizes that he is vulnerable. He's out in the open, correct? If you can tell me what page is, I'll get the exact terminology. Page, page 10, middle of page 10. Okay. Yes, he's saying he's yelling for a lockdown code red. Okay. He's also telling you specifically, no, 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 no. That's where I realize that I'm out in the open, in the middle. So then I go back right at the corner of the 700, 800 building, I go back. So he explained to you that, correct? That came from his mouth, correct? Yes. So he makes the transcriptions, he announces on his radios before he takes a position of cover, is what he's telling you, correct? Yes. And the video confirmed that that's exactly what he did, isn't that correct? Well, again, the video shows him on the radio at the 700 building. I don't remember seeing the radio as he's running from the 1200 building to the 700 building. The video doesn't show it, but you see him delayed getting to the 700 building, correct? I remember much of a delay. I remember him leaving the 1200 building pretty quickly, getting to the 700 building. Okay. And I don't remember there any radio. Did, did you speak to Kelvin Greenleaf? Uh, I personally did not. Uh, I know Detective, or I keep saying Detective Inspector, or, or Special Agent Riddick did. You're not saying that you have evidence that my client didn't get on his both school radio and police radio prior to taking cover at the 700 building. I'm just telling you what I can recall from right. the video, and I don't recall him being on the radio when he retreated from the 1200 building to the 700 building. I remember at the 700 building, clearly you can tell he's on his radio. Now, I'm just trying to be accurate on what I can remember from the video. I understand, but you also had the dispatch transcript to know that literally one second after Feist is shot, my client is on the radio announcing shots fired. If you show me the transcript to refresh my memory, I'll certainly, I'll certainly do that. He also tells you that my concern was because I didn't know if the shots were coming out of the building. He brings that up to you on page 11. That another one of his concerns was that he thought maybe shots were coming out of the building. Yes. And my concern That's was because I didn't know if the shots were coming out. That was another one of his concerns that he expressed to you two days after the shooting, correct? Well, that's part of the statement he made, but yes. We'll, we'll, get, we'll keep going, okay? okay? Just want to be accurate. Or were they coming somewhere out of the west side? That was another one of his concerns, correct? Yes. Because the west side is where Aaron Feist was shot, correct? Again, we're going to go east and west. West is, the school is the most east eastern building, the 1200 building, so... West to me means anything west toward the 700 building, back to the 1300 building, to the football field. Feist was shot on the opposite side exactly of where Feist he was, was shot. at, correct? I know, I know exactly where Aaron Feist was shot. Over 73. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Madam Corporal, can I use one voice yes, at a time? Yes, thank you, Judge. Sorry, Sorry. Sometimes for the witness. The lawyer will ask a question, stop talking, the witness will answer the question, and then the witness will stop talking, and then the lawyer will ask another question. Go ahead, sir, ask your next question. Feist was shot over 73 yards away from where my client was. Isn't that correct, sir? When your client first got to the 1200 building, that is correct. And then here he is, again, saying on page 11, because it sounded like it might have been even outside, correct? Yes. 
And he explained, that's why I, you know, I went back to the corner at this point, correct? Yes. The, your training, and again, we're talking about training before 2018, before this. Your training, if you believe that you're potentially going to be harmed with gunfire, you're not trained to just stand out in the open, correct? Uh, you're also trained not to retreat from cover, yes. I understand. Okay, just trying to be accurate. But you are trained, are you not, to take a position of cover where you think that you might get hit with bullets, yes or no? Yes. He tells you that I keep, I'm keeping cover on the east side of the building to keep them cover with my firearm directly towards the doors, possible with an anticipation if maybe if the shooter or whoever it was, which someone may be was going to come out of this door. Another one of his concerns was there might be a shooter or shooters coming out of the doors of the 1200 building, correct? Yes. That was one of the possibilities, correct? Yes. He never narrows it down to say, I knew there was a shooter or shooters definitely in the 1200 building, correct? He never does that in the 16 pages of discussing this incident, yes or no? No, not specifically. He talks about the 1200 building and then he says those other things we just testified to. Right. And then he tells you about waiting and he sees an officer running right up in the parking lot up to a tree right over yes. right that turned out to be accurate correct yes there was an officer that was officer burton wasn't it that is correct burton never you learned went into the 1200 building correct that is correct burton was with carl springs correct that is correct burton had additional information above and beyond what any bso officer had correct if he had his radio on, I would assume so, yes. I never interviewed Officer Burton personally. He says right here, it was, it was Carl Springs, Tim Burton, who was an SRO, correct? Yes. And Tim had a long gun on him, he tells you, correct? That's correct. And again, you're still doing this in a temporal sense, right? What happened next? What happened next? Chronological, because you say on page 12, all right, what happens from there, correct? Yes. yes. And he tells you that he's telling him, he's referring to Burton, correct? Yes. I heard a couple of shots, haven't heard anything since, and he's just taking over by, you know, behind the tree, I'm taking cover here, and units are now starting. There was a 26 second gap from the time that he hears the first shots to the time that the second shots are fired, correct? Again, that sounds accurate. I have and, to look at the timeline. And you don't know when it is that my client hears the next round of gunfire, correct? Not based on a statement, no. In fact, the last two minutes of the four minutes and 15 seconds of the shooting occurred when the shooter was on the west side of the 1200 building, correct? He is going, he comes up on the east side and he travels westbound. Yes. And then he abandons his weapon and goes down the west staircase. Correct. So the last shots fired were from room 1240, the teacher's lounge. Yes or no? Yes. That's on the opposite side of the building from where my client is, correct? Yes. Well, no, again, he's opposite side from the part of the building where your client first went, he, your client went to the 700 building, which was like a third of the way down the building now. So your client, that, that 700 position is actually closer to the teacher's plan area than he was at the east doors. You're still talking at least over 50 yards at least. I'm just trying to be accurate. I'm just, you know, again. Yes or no, it would have been at least 50 yards, if not more, correct? I would say that would be close to being accurate. And the last two minutes of the shots fired by the shooter, Nicholas Cruz, came out of the teacher's lounge, room 1240. Yes or no, sir? Can you say that one more time? The last two minutes of shots fired by Nicholas Cruz came out of 
the 1240 teacher's lounge, yes or no? I'd have to look at the timeline. I don't think that's accurate. He fired 10 rounds out of that, that room, and I don't remember if it was two minutes or 40 seconds. Isn't it a fact that he began shooting at 225.34, and he stopped firing at 227.35 out of the teacher's lounge, yes or no, sir? Okay, I'd have to look at the timeline for the exact times, but you were accurate about the last 10 rounds came out of the teacher's planning lounge, yes. And he's assuming a position of a sniper fire, is he not? Because he's shooting at kids and or cops out the window, yes or no? I believe that's accurate. The last 10 rounds. And the active shooter policy states, does it not, that if you believe you're dealing with sniper fire, you are to isolate, contain, and wait for SWAT. Isn't that correct? Yes or no? Again, I'd have to look at the policy. I, I know the active shooter policy goes, you have to go to the gunfire, and it doesn't say specifically if you think it's a sniper that I recall, but if you show it to me, I'll read it. I will. Thank you. And if that's, it, usually it's if he's barricaded, you call for SWAT. Well, but if he's actively ask, killing people, no. I would I, say that's inaccurate. You, you don't believe that he's barricaded in the teacher's lounge? Barricaded and still shooting is a whole bit different ballgame from barricaded and not shooting. Barricaded with a guy in a gun, you call SWAT because he's no longer hurting or killing people. If he's in a room and he's acting as a sniper, you still have to go up there and get him and stop him. If you know where he's at, first of all, correct? Well, you got to find out where he's at. That's what we're supposed to do. That's right. The first unit, he tells you, are saying there's someone over by the football field, correct? Yes. He hadn't been able to review the dispatch transcript to know that there were officers like Kratz who said shots fired by the football field, correct? Yes. That's correct. So that turned out to be completely accurate, correct? Yes. And again, he's telling you that he's making it very clear. In my mind, I was kind of, is he maybe running towards that? Maybe he's not even in the building. He might be somewhere way out over here. I mean, in my mind, I didn't obviously didn't know, you know, where the shooter was. And I started wondering if he had fled westbound at that point, because they're talking about people injured near this football field, which is quite a distance from the building. You remember when he told you that, correct? Yes. And the football field is quite a distance from the 1200 building, isn't it? It's on the, again, we're going to go north northwest corner of the campus, yes. There's literally hundreds of yards between the 1200 building east side and the football field, yes or no? Yes. He does tell you that he assisted when someone came over and asked for keys, correct? Yes. And he didn't keep the keys from them. He immediately gave those keys to be of service, correct? Uh, it doesn't say time for him. He said he gave the guy his keys who asked for it. Okay. And you understood that to mean that he was being of service to somebody who was asking for the keys, correct? Yes. He gave the keys to the 1200 building doors to whoever uh, the SWAT personnel wanted. And you determined that to be factually accurate, correct? I didn't personally take the statements from those people, but yeah, I read the statements where that was accurate. And he made it very clear to you too that he gave the keys because he wanted to make sure that they had access to the classrooms, correct? Yes. And that was to specifically help the people in the 1200 building, correct? Yes. Do you 
know the name of these five kids who allegedly came out of the 1200 building? Again, that was part of the secondary investigation, which I was not a part of. All the police response part of the investigation was done by the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. So I don't Keith know. Keith Riddick, correct? Well, he's just one of them. He was the main agent. I don't know their names. No, I'd have to go back and look at these reports. There's no evidence that any of these kids came running towards my client and gave him any real-time intelligence, correct? I'd have to look at his investigation because I did not interview any of those people. So I, I can't answer that. I don't know what they said when they were interviewed. He tells you, does he not, that he ordered Assistant Principal Jeffrey Morford to go to the video room, did he not? Uh, yes. And the purpose, he tells you, why he did that was to try to find out where the shooter or shooters were located, yes or no? Yeah, Bob, well, that's logically, I believe, why he did it. I don't remember him saying it, but yeah, that's logical. And that turned out to be true, correct? Yes. And you were able to confirm that when Jeffrey Morford and Greenleaf were reviewing the video, that was being relayed to my client by the school radio, correct? Um, I believe so, yes. And you also confirmed that then my client was announcing what he was being told by Jeffrey Morford, correct? Again, I'd have to listen to the radio transmission, how Nicholas Cruz's name first came out, whether it was over Coral Springs, because by that time I think we had uniformed people got their way down to the uh, administrative building and were actually in the room when the video was being played back, is the way I recall it. So I don't remember whose radio it came across when I heard it. I just heard Nicholas Cruz's name come across the radio. So my question is, did you investigate to determine whether my client was on the scene announcing what he's hearing over his school radio that was coming from Jeffrey Morford? Did you, do you have any first-hand knowledge of that? I'd have to look at the radio transmissions. I don't recall him actually saying Nicholas Cruz over the radio. Well, we're talking about over the school radio. We don't have a transcript of that. It was exactly. not recorded. So did you speak to the witnesses who were around my client to learn whether my client was conveying that information over the school radio that he was getting from Jeffrey Morford? Objection. I can't see that, sir. No, that's a yes or no question. It's overruled. You can answer that question. Again, the police response investigation was not conducted by me, so I did not interview any of those people. I have to look at Keith Riddick's investigation to see if he did and what they said. It turned out, you learned, that the information that my client was getting from Jeffrey Morford was old. It wasn't accurate, correct? The information that they were putting about him coming down from the third to the second floor was 20 minutes inaccurate, yes. That wasn't my client's fault, correct? Uh, no, I don't believe so, no. Because again, I don't remember your client putting that out. And at this point, there's no question that the BSO police radios were useless, isn't that correct? Yes, but can I go back to that last question? Because now I remember how it came out. It came out through Sergeant Rich Rossman, who was standing aside of a Coral Springs guy and a Marjorie Stoneman Douglas staff member who heard the, he's coming down from the third to the second floor. That's who put it out over the BSO radio. Right. You Rich know where Rossman. they got that information from? The control room. And who was the control room speaking to? Uh, again, I don't know, because I didn't do those interviews. Gotcha. You're not saying it wasn't Scott Peterson who was speaking to Jeffrey Warford on the school radio. You just don't know, correct? No, because it's not recorded. And I didn't conduct those interviews because that was part of the investigation into the police response. That Keith Riddick did? That the Florida Department of Law Enforcement did, yes. Yeah. And he tells you that he was given a description by Jeffrey Warford, who was watching the video, and that description was of a subject who was wearing a male, Bert was a male, wearing a burgundy shirt, black pants, and black hat, correct? Yeah, what page are you on, sir? I'm on page 16 of 36. Okay. You remember him telling you that, correct? Yes. And, he to and you asked, and you got that description from a vice principal, and he tells you yes, right? Yes. And you say, watching the video, answer, correct. 
Yes. You confirm that to be accurate, correct? Yes. When my client tells you that he announced over his police radio, get the school locked down, gentlemen, you later confirm that by seeing on the dispatch that my client did in fact do that, correct? Yes, I remember him. That part I do remember him saying over the police radio. And you noticed that he asked for the lockdown or demanded the lockdown about five times over his police radio, correct? Uh, again, without having to review it all, I don't remember how many times. I know he asked for the roadways to be blocked. He asked for the parking lot, keep people out of the parking lot. Yeah, because school was letting out, right? Again, the terminology of why he was doing it, I don't know. I... But you, you did know that this happened in the afternoon, oh, right yeah, before was, school right. was letting out, exactly. correct? Exactly, sure. And you do know that parents, kids, would then be coming onto campus any moment, correct? I would assume so, yes. And it's consistent with training then to keep those people out of an area where they then may get hit with bullets. Isn't that correct? In this case, in my opinion, it was the absolute wrong thing to say to the responding deputies because it was an active shooting situation, it, still in progress. It turned out to be in retrospect right but when my clients there not knowing where the shooter or shooters are located and he feels that parents and kids may be harmed training tells you to keep them away yes or no no that's inaccurate he told the officers to block holmberg road some of those officers actually heard the shots being fired in that direction was a complete contrast to what those officers should have done. Those officers hearing those shots should have rushed onto campus as well. Did you know whether those officers thought the shots were coming from the 1200 building or somewhere else? They had no idea. They didn't, correct. But they should not have been setting up a traffic post. They should have been coming on campus to find out where they were coming from. And that's what protocol and police work in general tells you to do. They were given the wrong direction. He doesn't lock down the school. Parents and teachers come, and then Cruz shoots and kills them. Objection. Yeah, I, I've never heard a question, Mr. Agarash. I'm quite candid with you. I'm behind, at the end of my patients with this type of examination. So if you have another question, I do. it ends with a question mark, yes. you may ask your question. You said that you checked the transmissions that my client made in real time, correct? Oh, yes, I, I looked at the transcriptions, yes. So you were able to verify that at 228, my client is announcing to BSO over his BSO radio. The last time we heard shots was between the 12 and 1300 building, correct? I'd have to look at the timeline to see the exact time he said that, but I do remember that. You also remember him in real time asking Deputy Perry if he knew where the shooters were located, correct? Yes, I do recall that. And then 18 minutes after he first announces that he, the last time we heard shots was between the 12 and 1300 building, he again repeats that. Last time we heard shots was between the 12 and 1300 building, correct? I'd have to look at the timeline for the time frame. You're saying 18 minutes. I don't recall him saying it the second time. I remember him saying it the one time, yes. Okay. You're not saying he didn't say it again. That's easy. That's why we do these timelines. If you give it to me to refresh my memory, I'll refresh my memory. I don't remember the exact times on everything on that timeline.
Nothing further, Your Honor. Thank you, sir. You're ready. Detective Percio, were there any windows shot out of the tall tall building? They were impacted. I wouldn't describe them as shot out, but they, they had been impacted by rounds on the second floor. Did any of them? And on the teacher's planning area. And did any of them shatter? Um, they partially in the teacher's planning area. Um, they didn't shatter. The fragments got out of the, the, uh, the third floor teacher planning area and ended up on the roof of the 1300 building. But the, the window... That's facing the football field, correct? Yes. Okay. And did Scott Peterson ever use the word sniper with you? No. Did he ever tell you that he was receiving fire? No. Explain the distinction between an active shooter and a barricaded subject. Again, uh, an active shooter, you know, again, is somebody who is actively shooting and or killing people. On an active shooter scenario, one of the uh, goals in trying to stop an active shooter is to get him to barricade himself where he's no longer doing harm to anyone, but he's contained in an area where he's not killing people. He's barricaded. You block all the entrances so he can't escape, and then you call in the SWAT boys with all their specialized equipment to get him out. Now, you said one of the goals, and earlier you disagreed with the term kill the killer. Why? The goal is to stop him from killing people. Excuse me. And that doesn't mean killing him. It means slowing him down. It means distracting him. It means anything so those kids can find safety. Why don't you order a perimeter? Because again, the goal is to try to stop him from actively killing people. You also train not to retreat from cover something that you said. Can you please explain what you meant by that? If you have cover, you don't run across an open area to try to determine what's going on. You have cover. You try to determine what's going on from a position of cover and then move towards where the threat is. When he said may have been outside or really close, what building was he referencing? 1200 building. And now he admitted to you that he threw the keys from his position outside. He never entered the 1200 building, correct? No, he did not. And when he told you that he gave his keys to SWAT, that was after the shots had stopped being fired, correct? That is correct. He didn't do any of those things that he told you, and he didn't tell you in his interview that he did those things while the shots were happening, did he? No, he did not. Now, the problem with the radio was, as you put it, um, how many people were trying to key up. Is it fair to say that the radio issues occurred after the shooting had stopped, once the shooter had left the building? Yes, I would say that's accurate. And the problem with the radios, explain where the radios fell on your priority list while you were on that team. They were lower on my priority list because we were trying to get an active intelligence from anybody who was on the scene when the shooting was occurring and where um, the suspect or where the victims could be located. And that's because the person hearing gunfire is the source of active information, active intelligence, correct? Yes, one and of the best sources. The be I'm sorry, say that again. He's one of the best sources. And the whole radio, who's giving information to who? when someone's listening to active gunfire? Who's the source of real-time information? Who's supposed to be using the radio? Well, the, the person on scene who's the closest to what's occurring is the person in command. It's not a question of rank. It's not a question of position. It's the person with the most pertinent information to lead the rest of the responding people to what's going on uh, at the scene. Aaron Fife, and according to defense counsel, was shot at 2, 23, 25. You 
while his client was standing outside the Qualcomm facility, did you confirm that those shell casings showed that Aaron Spikes was actually shot on the west side of that building? Yes. And at that time, Scott Peterson was standing on the east side of that Qualcomm facility? That's correct. And according to his own attorney, for four minutes and 15 seconds, his client stood there while gunshots were going off? Actually, he moved from the 1200 building to the 700 building position for that period of time. And after retreating from where those gunshots are happening, he then remained in that position, according to himself, the statement he took in the surveillance that you reviewed, correct? That is correct. And during that time, the shooter was on the second and the third floor while Scott Peterson was standing outside the 1200 building, correct? Actually, he was standing outside of the 700 building, but yes, he was outside 70 some feet away. And so that was the two to three shots that killed Aaron Spikes, the six rounds on the second floor, the 61 rounds on the third floor, so about 70 rounds, all while Scott Peterson stood outside of the 1200 building after retreating to the 700 building. Is that correct? That is correct. And he told you that he heard two to three shots? That's correct. You said it was very clear to you that he meant that he heard only two to three shots. Why was that clear to you? Because during the statement, he reemphasized that once he got to the position at the 700 building, he heard no longer any shots being fired and it got quiet. And I've actually heard him make the same statement of two or three shots to other people. Just an objection, hearsay. Can't overrule something that was a statement from the defendant. Go ahead, Ms. Bunch, ask the next question. Just one final question. When else did you hear him say that he only heard two to three shots? In interviews. Objection, please give some more. Now, I just want to make sure that I understand your position. Thank you so much, Detective Kinsey. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Your cross, go ahead. The prosecutor just asked you about the best source of information on the scene. The best source were the kids who called in to 911. Isn't that correct? Yes. It would have been one of the best sources for the Coral Springs response. Because those kids precisely knew where the shooter was located, correct? They knew where he had shot people, yes. They also knew that kids and adults had been shot, correct? Yes. That information never was relayed during the shooting to any DSO officers, yes or no? Objection, stipulation. That's overruled, sir, but I don't want you to guess. If you have personal knowledge, you can answer this question. Go ahead. The only response that I remember was Coral Springs tried to transfer calls from those students to us and never got to us. So it never happened, correct? No. The transfer of the calls never got to DSO's dispatch. And we talked about Burton, but my client and Burton weren't the only ones standing around. And by that I mean taking positions of cover. 
Best was there. Carl Springs, Officer Best, correct? Yes. He didn't go into the 1200 building, correct? Uh, not that I can recall, no. And there were other officers who also remained in a position of cover and didn't go into the 1200 building, correct? Many of those arrived afterwards, yes, but that's correct. And many of them heard shots as well and didn't go in, yes or no? The only ones that, re that I recall uh, heard shots were the VSO ones that were positioned on Holmberg Road blocking the roadway. People like Miller? Uh, I don't remember Miller's name, but there were seven of them, I believe. And you, sir, you never went into the 1200 building, correct? Not until after I arrested Nicholas Cruz. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Jack, if I could just have your name one second. State, do we have time to start the next one? Sorry, right, this time to stay right. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the state hasn't rested their case. Uh, there's some matters that I need to handle uh, with the lawyers, so I'm going to send you to lunch. Uh, it's going to be a slightly longer lunch. I'm going to have you back at the normal time, which is 145. Uh, with the same admonition as always, please don't discuss the facts of the case, the evidence, the witnesses, or the testimony amongst yourselves or anyone else. If you'll leave the notepads in your chairs, they will be waiting for you when you come back. I hope you have a nice lunch. I will see you at the jury room at 145, 1.45 p.m. this afternoon. outside the presence of the jury, everyone can be seated. Can I just run to the bathroom for two minutes? Well, yeah, but I'm going to let Mr. Uh, Ms. Gomez here. Yes, you can go to the restroom. Okay. Uh, I had sustained the state's objections. I was going to allow the defense to make a proffer as to what additional questions they wanted to ask uh, the witness. We're outside the presence of the jury. Mr. Agarwash, any additional questions that you have to Yes. One of the primary reasons why you interviewed my client at all was because your supervisor asked you to, correct? Sergeant Jonathan Brown brought, he's the one who made the arrangements for Mr. Peterson to come down. So, yeah. And that was done because family members inquired about what my client was doing during the shooting, correct? That was one of, that was the one reason Jonathan Brown wanted him to be interviewed, but I was interviewing him for my purpose as well. Okay, that's what I was asking for. No, no other questions? Um, I'm trying to think of the other um, issues. Honestly, I'm at a loss. I, I forget what else there was that had been sustained here. So. Okay, state based on that. Any questions that you would like to ask outside of the presence of the jury? No. Okay, state, this is Detective Excuse. Okay. Uh, sir, you may step down. Thank you very much. So while he's doing that, the state having rested their case, uh, I'm inclined to just send you all to your lunch break now. Uh, as soon as we come back, I'll hear any motions on behalf of Mr. Peterson. I'm not prejudging anything, so we'll take it from there based on those. Mr. Aguilar, is that okay if we handle those motions after the lunch break? Yes, sir. Thank you. State, anything you need me to address before we take our lunch break? No, sir. All right, so uh, we're otherwise going to be in recess. I hope you all have a good lunch. I'll see you at 145. Sure.
Okay, I'm going to go back on the record. This is State versus Scott Peterson, 197166 CF10A. I have Ms. Gomes and Mr. Killer and Mr. Klinger present for the state. I have Mr. Igarsh present with Mr. Peterson, who likewise is present. We are outside the presence of the jury. Uh, the state having rested their case. Any motions on behalf of the defendant, Mr. Igarsh, please? Yes, Your Honor. First, we would renew all motions made throughout this trial, including the ones made during jury selection and throughout. Um, the state's case, and we would be moving for a judgment of acquittal on all 11 counts. The court knows each and every element. I don't have to go through them. The court heard the testimony in this case, and we do not believe that the state met their burden um, as required by law. Okay, state, your response to that? Uh, Your Honor, I, the court law knows the standard in the light most favorable evidence, is looking at the evidence in the light most favorable to the state. The state has put forward considerable evidence to the jury um, to allow them to go back and apply that to the law the court gave them and the all counts of the information. So, Mr. Clare, let me ask you this. When does the defendant become a character? Uh, when does the defendant become a character for the listed victims in count one through ten, or one through seven? Well, when does he become a character? He, he becomes a caregiver once he becomes the SRO of the school. SRO of the school. Yeah. If he wants the individual who goes. Well, he's not charged with anything as it relates to the victims in the first four, correct? That's correct. Okay, so I presume that means at some point he's determined, or the state has determined he's not a caregiver that has criminal liability for what takes place on the first four. Oh, no. But you're telling me he does have criminal liability for what takes place on the third floor. So my question is, when does he become a caregiver for the people on the third floor? All right. The reason he wasn't charged with anyone on the first floor is he, he couldn't have gotten there in time to help him in any way. So we decided since he was so on his way to the scene, not to charge him with the first floor, but we would only charge him with what happened after he arrived, which is about the time that he was with uh, the shooter that So you're saying as a caregiver for everyone, but I'm looking at the first element as to uh, neglect of a child, page 27.03. You're saying the first element doesn't apply to anyone on the first floor because it's nothing that he did or failed to do that would have changed anything that happened on the first floor. Is that what you're telling me? Yeah, it, we, exa exactly. We didn't feel that he, because he wasn't even there yet, he couldn't have even gotten there.
But he's a caregiver for everybody. Yes. Every all the four thousand students at the school. Yes, sir. And the forty acres of the school there. Or whatever the size of that school is. So there's every school resource officer. The state's position is every school resource officer was a caregiver for every student at every public school uh, upon setting foot on the campus. The school that he's contracted with is what right. he is the SRO. That's the special relationship that you see from the contract. And you see the various training and what he has. That he has a special relationship with the, with the student at the student faculty and administrators of the school. Because he, he takes on that role. And it's a, it's a contractual role that's set and um, we put all those documents into evidence. Um, you know, you, you see he has special powers, SROs, right? They can, they can detain students, they can search without uh, probable cause. Um, they're given all these various uh, extra rights that a, a, a patrolman on the street does not have, and even if that patrolman came into the school, he wouldn't have. But the SRO does. The SRO is given a, a, a different position, and he operates under a different set, in some instances, under a different set of, of uh, rules. So you have a very special relationship between him and the school. What is he there for? He is there to protect the students. That's the whole point of it. And he, that's why he's the head of security. You should know the school inside and out, know the security system inside and out. He is there for the daily stuff that goes wrong and then when, God forbid, things really go wrong. It doesn't matter. He, that's his position. So let me ask you this then. Next. Uh, can I just add one thing? Sure. We feel that at this point that would be a decision for the jury to make. The caregiver decision. That's not uh, you made a legal decision back way back a couple months weeks ago about or maybe it was even longer than that, about what statutes you were going to require a caregiver. Uh, but for now, it's the state's Mark, position. We've given you It's not my decision. I'm just looking at the standard instructions from the Florida Supreme Court. You, you charge them under 827.03, subsection 2B, and the Florida Supreme Court has promulgated standard jury instructions for 827.03, subsection 2B. What was that number, Paul? 827.03, <laughs> number 2, little b. And the third element is that the defendant was a caregiver for what it was ever alleged victim. I mean, and right, that's a jury question, but I guess I'm trying to figure out, looking at the light most favorable to the state, how you've proven that with the evidence. Well, also there was evidence of him being a mentor, one of the reasons behind the program, and I believe the case was cited to in or was in the motion to dismiss for Abby. Um, that he, that's another role he has, is being mentors to the students at the school. That's part of the program. Um, so there was, there was quite, decide whether or not he has a caregiver position. The second element, let's say you get over the caregiver hurdle, the second element as to counts one through seven says in doing so, or at least in counts one through six, the defendant caused great bodily harm, permanent disability, or permanent disfigurement to the listed victim. Okay. Did Mr. Cruz do that? Right, are you taking that from the jury instruction? Yes, sir. Two of neglect of a child, 16.5, is the defendant caused great bodily harm, permanent disability, or permanent disfigurement to, and then you fill in the listed victim. So tell me what the evidence is that he caused great bodily harm, permanent disability, or permanent disfigurement? Well, that, Judge, I believe, if, I, if I've got it correct, the, that comes from the, it's in the jury instructions underneath the, the list of the four um, elements that need to be proven. Um, and it's also in the statute that that comes from um, the neglect itself can be based on repeated conduct or criminal incident or omission that resulted in or reasonably could have been expected to result in serious physical, mental, or injury or a substantial risk of death to the child. It's, it's all read together because that's the whole purpose of it is that you did 
not supply, he did not give the, um, uh, the care that you were supposed to do, um, and that resulted in the injury. So you were, by your admission, by not doing what you were supposed to do. Well, he caused it by failing to act. That's the state theory. I, I know, I realize the word cause, you know, at, at times makes people maybe pause, not pause, but pause for a second. Um, but that is how the statute reads, and that is how it, it's read in paramissal, it's in other paragraphs in the statute itself, and it's in the jury instructions. Uh, that omission, at least in this case, we're talking about, uh, it's not always an omission either, we are, we're not saying it. there's some things that were omitted, but there's also some things that he did that were not, that didn't do any good or weren't helpful. So he did do, he did do certain things, he did do other things. Yeah, I understand that, but in 827.03 it says, the person who willfully or by culpable negligence neglects a child and in doing so causes great bodily harm, permanent disability or permanent disfigurement, it's in the jury instruction as well, that he caused it. So the state's position is that he, the defendant caused these injuries, or at least enough so to be held criminally responsible for them? The defendant, it comes, uh, yes, because it comes from the qualification uh, that's in the, that's there in the instructions and in 827.03 itself. Um, the neglect is under uh, number three. <coughs> neglect of a child may be based on repeated conduct or a single incident or omission that resulted in or reasonably could have been expected to result in serious physical or mental injury or a substantial risk of death to a child. So it's the conduct, right, and enables the killing to go on inside the building. He would, have, he would have to know that, right? The jury would have to be convinced through your evidence, and again, I'm supposed to look at the light most favorable to the state. The jury would have to be convinced that he knew there was someone in that building shooting people and that he failed to act or acted incorrectly so that his act or omission caused these injuries. He would have to know that that was happening, right? He would have to know that Injuries were happening, or just the shooting. He would have to know that the danger exists. He would have to know that something's going on in that building. Well, yeah, again, I think at this point you're touching on another issue that would be a factual issue for the jury to make a determination on whether it does fit into the statute. I mean, we've laid out all the things that that were done or not done uh, during that time period. Well, you, listen, there's not. I mean, you seek to find. I don't need a vote, but. But let's say if I believe in a light most favorable to the state that you have proven that the defendant maybe didn't follow his training or act in a manner that was consistent with the training. But that's not what the jury's being asked to decide. They're being asked to decide, did he commit the crime of neglect of a child? And the crime of neglect of a child says that he caused the injuries. So I guess that's the part that I'm stuck on. Well, How did he cause these injuries? He caused the, caused the injuries with his omission. His failure to do what he was he was supposed to do, he didn't do anything. He 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 goes over it and stays for forty eight minutes in one spot, and instead of as you heard some of the testimony today, oh, open the door, check the check to see what's going on, uh, why talk to the students, um, go for the sound of the shots. Uh, it, it was all laid there, laid out the information actually um, at various points. Uh, you know, not speaking to the students, not going to the sound of the gunfire, not speaking <coughs> out the shooting. There was a whole plethora of, of in stuff that he could have done that he didn't do. And that then forms the basis of the causation of the, the killing to continue on because he isn't doing what he was supposed to be doing in, the, in caring for this child. Okay, uh, well, at this point, Again, understanding we're not at the end of the trial, we're not at the end of the evidence, but at this point, I am to look at the evidence in a light most favorable to the state. I don't know what part of the evidence, witnesses, or testimony the jury's going to believe or not believe, but if they believe everything from the state's point of view, they, I guess they certainly could believe that the element of each crime has been proven beyond a reasonable doubt, or in fact, they may conclude that it hasn't been, but 
that would be their decision to make at least at this point. So respectfully, the defense motion for judgment acquittal is going to be denied as to all counts. Next. Defense, do we have witnesses ready to go? We do, Judge. Okay. Anything you need me to address before we bring the jury back in? Uh, no, Your Honor. Just note our objection to the court not granting this motion of judgment acquittal. Um, the court was struggling with it. And even in the light most favorable to the state, they did not meet the elements of the crime. And I don't believe that we should be continuing with uh, these charges at this time. Okay. State, anything you need me to address before we bring the jury back in? So, Mr. Agarsall, we'll, we'll please bring the jury back in. We'll bring the jury back in. I'll welcome them back from the lunch break, explain to them that the state having rested their case, we're now going to turn to the defense presentation, and I'm going to ask you to call your next witness. Sounds good. Okay. Welcome back. Come on in. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Come on in. Ladies and gentlemen, once you're back in those seats, you may be seated. All the parties may be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, those of you using your notepads, I'll give you a moment to get the notepads back out. Ladies and gentlemen, when we took our lunch break, the state had rested their case. So at this point, we're now going to turn to the defense presentation. Mr. Agros, when you are ready, you may call your next witness. Thank you, Your Honor. The defense calls Suzanne Tamil. Suzanne Tamil. you reach it but before you have a seat you can just stop and look at me raise your right hand just so we tell the truth whole truth nothing but the truth all right please be seated and once you are seated if i can just get that chair all the way forward as far as it will go can you please state your full name and spell your full name suzanne camel um s-u-z-a-n-n-e-c-a-m-e-l Thank you. Good afternoon, Ms. Campbell. Good afternoon. Tell the jurors how you're feeling right now. I'm nervous. 
Have you ever Little nauseous. Yeah. Nauseous. Yeah. Have you ever testified in front of a jury before? No. I'll have you out of here as quick as possible. Tell us what you do for a living. I'm, I'm a teacher still. Okay. I teach it with Broward County still, the okay. hospital in Broward. And when did you start teaching? What year? Do you remember? 2003. And were you a teacher on February 14th, 2018? Yes. Tell the jurors where you were a teacher. All right, oh, Mr. McDouglas. And what building were you in? Um, my, my room was in the 700 building. And where is the 700 building in relation to the 1200 building? Well, it's like right across the uh, little field, okay. I guess. They're, they're run parallel to each other. And is it a far distance or a close distance? How would you calculate that? It's pretty close. Like, maybe from here to the back of the room. Okay. And when you walk out of your classroom, is that the building that you're staring at, the 1200 building? Yes. Okay. Well, yeah, it's right in front of me when you walk in. And, and what do you teach? What's your expertise? Math. All layers of math? Yes. And I want to take you back to that day. And what were you doing prior to the fire alarm going off in the afternoon? Well, I mean, we were having normal classes, and um, I was um, I was giving a test that day. Okay, some type of math exam for your students. Like a little, yeah. And what happened while you were giving the math exam? Um, one of my students was out going to the bathroom, and um, which student was that? His name was Xavier, and. Um, we heard, like the whole class, everybody heard noise and we didn't know what it was. So I thought immediately that maybe some, he was throwing something or I don't know. I just went outside to see if I could see him because he had gone to the bathroom and maybe I thought it, maybe it was him because he was outside for a little while before that happened. Okay. And um, so then I walked outside and um, I turned toward the bathroom area because you when you walk out it's like an outdoor um corridor i guess let me let me show you a photograph and this may be if we're able to identify were you on the first floor or the second floor of the 700 building? second floor second floor okay let me show you what's been marked as defense exhibit Yes. Okay. What, what are you looking at here? Well, that's the 700 building. Okay. Behind that, I think, is the 1300. Okay. Are you able to see where your classroom is located? Right over there, that's the theater. When you take a look at this photograph, I don't know if your classroom is contained. Mm -hmm. Like upstairs in the middle of, like by that tube. Okay. Can you just put your finger as close to it? I mean, you can't see tons of the tube, but it's like right there. It's okay. in between those. All right. So somewhere towards the middle of the 700 building? Like right about there, yeah. And then that building closest to you, is that the 1200 building? This is, yes. Okay. And so you think that Xavier is the source of the noise that you're hearing, correct? Well, at first, yeah, I didn't know what was going on. So I went out to try to see what was happening. What did those noise sounded like at first when you were inside your classroom? Loud bangs. It, I didn't, none of us had any idea what was going on. It was just kind of got our attention. Did you, and again, we're talking about before you go outside, right? Because you yes. hear additional shots or you hear noises when you go outside, correct? All right, so is that a yes? Yes. All right. We're just talking about what you hear inside your classroom before you go outside. What did you think that those noises were? You said loud? Well, it sounded a little bit like somebody lit firecrackers and threw them outside the door. That's 
what it sounded like at first. Did it sound like these were contained within a building or outside? No, it sounded like it was right outside. I, like, I thought it was right outside my room. That's why I thought it maybe okay. it was my student. Okay. And so you go outside to investigate. What happens next? Well, there was no, it was pretty empty, actually. There was nobody there. So I turned toward the bathroom to see if I could see him where Xavier went. And um, he is, this, is this all from the second floor of balcony? Yes. Okay. yes. And then what do you, what do you do? What happens next? Um, he, well, we started hearing loud noises, pops again, and I didn't know what it was. I just started looking around everywhere, and then he came running around the corner. He is Xavier. Xavier, correct. and we just kind of looked at each other, and I said, like, what are you doing? And he said, it's not me, it's not me. And I, we had, like, a quick minute to try to figure out what it was, and, like, neither one of us, like, could quite figure out what was going on. It sounded almost like something was being, like, it sounded like fireworks being thrown at us is really what it sounded like. It almost sounded like something he even hit the building where we were, but we didn't. No, I yelled at him to get in the room. That was all before the fire alarm. No. Could you tell whether the shots that you, did, did, you, did there ever come a time where you thought that they were shots? Well, yes, when is, I, we were in the room for hours. Okay. We knew. But you didn't know, you didn't know what they were when you were on the balcony, correct? No. And as best you thought, I think I heard you say, you thought somebody was throwing fireworks at you, correct? Yeah, it was incredibly loud and you just couldn't, I don't, we couldn't figure out what was going on. I, I want to freeze the moment when you're on the balcony and go back to your state of mind. Did you think that they, the, the, these firecracker noise, um, did you think that they were inside a building or outside of a building? It was just so loud. Instinctively, we bent down in that picture. You could see the wall. We bent down but below the wall just because we didn't know what it was. It just immediately kind of dropped down like that and then tried to peek over to see what was going on. Tell the jurors why you bent down. Why, why did you think that might help? Well, just because it was so loud, it sounded like something was coming at us. Like, we didn't know what it was, neither one of us. And then he just ran into the room, and I kind of stayed by the wall for a little bit, and then... Did you ever think that these were shots coming from inside the 1200 building? When I was outside, I didn't know what it was. By the way, you're no longer teaching at the school, correct? No. How come? I wasn't able to. Yeah, that's the same. Okay. Right. Thank you, Ms. Thomas. Okay, cross examination, please. Thank you, Judge. Good afternoon, Ms. Thomas. Hi. I attended to speak a little bit quickly. Can you just let us please know? Let me know, okay? Okay. Before February 14th, 2018, you had never heard gunshots before, had you? No. From the time that you left your classroom to the time that you went back in, how long would you estimate that was? Um, it wasn't a lot of time. Do you think it was more than a minute, less than a minute? Maybe a, a minute or two. Because it, was it wasn't just out and back in. We were out there for a little bit trying to figure out what was going on. So from the time that you left your classroom uh, to the time that you bent down, how long, and you can estimate this for me, how long would you say that was? Um, within a minute, I guess. Okay. So if that's within a minute and you think you were outside maybe a minute to two minutes, how long were you actually bent down peeking over the ledge? You can ballpark it for me. I'm not going to hold you to the exact second. 30 seconds, 40 seconds. Because 
the noise was happening while that was going on. So, and it is loud. I'm sorry, as you described it, it was hard to watch. Very loud noises. Yeah, it was it, so loud that you thought something was actually hitting your building, building seven hundred. Yeah, and then we weren't sure what was going on. It sounded like. It sounded like something was hitting it or like a building was collapsing or something huge. It was just dreadfully loud and you could tell it was just not, something was wrong. It was very wrong. And you could tell even having never heard gunshots before, you knew something was wrong. Maybe that it wasn't gunshots, but something was wrong. Is that yes. correct? Now, when you peeked over the ledge, what did you see? Well, I mean, when you look over the ledge, you could just see straight at the 1200 building. And did you, and, know, did you notice anything specific in the 1200 building or around the 1200 building? Well, yeah, I could see like my, like my head was focusing where the noise was all coming from, I guess. So it caught my eye that I could see into the bottom, like, the very bottom window in that first classroom. So you said that the sound uh, uh, drew your attention. So you could tell generally it was coming from north of you, around the 1200 building. I just knew it wasn't like at my building because like I could see everything right around me. So I knew it had to be out there. So I just started looking around, okay. yeah. And eventually something in the 1200 building caught your attention. Yeah, right? you could see. What could you see? Could you get it? You could see in that, in the window, it was almost surreal. It was like, while the pops were happening, you could see like smoke billowing there. And what do you mean by smoke billowing? Just to like, explain what it looked like. I know it's a tough question, but just the best that you can to explain what it looked like. Like, like puffing lightly out the window with the shots. And with the, with the puffing that you saw, was that? And then I thought the building was collapsing. I thought that was, was gonna happen. With, with the puffing that you saw, was that corresponding to the sounds you were hearing of the shots or the, the loud noises you heard? Yes. Now, ultimately, a code red was called, correct? Yes. But even before that, when the fire alarm went off, you did not allow your students to go to leave your classroom, did you? No, I was, well, that all happened right before the fire alarm. And when I saw that smoke, I started thinking that building's coming down, so I didn't let my kids go out at all. I made them all just stay in the classroom, and then there was a short amount of time before, <laughs> after the fire alarm, and then somebody else came on screaming about the code red. Do you recall, what do you mean somebody come, came on? Somebody, somebody on? on the overhead, on, the, on, the, on the loudspeakers. The okay. Did you recognize that voice as uh, any assistant principal in particular? I'm not sure. Okay. So, if I if I understand correctly, while you were bending down, is that when the fire alarm goes off? If you recall. Um, the fire alarm went off, it was a little bit after. It was after I saw the smoke coming from that window, because the fire alarm went off like while I was starting to go back to my classroom anyway, and then I heard the fire alarm and the kids started getting up and I had another teacher in the room and we all kept everybody just in the room. Nobody got went out. So the order, and I, and I don't mean to be complicated, but I'm just trying to get the order down. And then shortly thereafter was the code red. Okay, so just rewinding just a little bit. You go outside to see Xavier, because you hear a loud noise, correct? Yes. You see Xavier, he comes over and he says something to the effect of it wasn't me. Mm -hmm. Is that a yes, I'm sorry? Yes. Okay. Then you hear more noises, so you and Xavier both bend down. Um, I don't know if Xavier did. Okay. So I you, think I was telling him to get in the classroom. Okay. So I don't remember exactly what he did. Okay. So he ultimately ran back to the classroom. Yeah, and I was in, like, here's the door. I was in front of the door, and he came down this way and went in, and I stayed there for a little bit by that wall. Before I went in. And that's when you're bent down, peeking over. Fire alarm goes off. You then go to the classroom and tell everybody to stay inside. Yes. Did you do that to protect your students? Because something was going on? 
yeah, I didn't know what was going on. I just knew that if the building was coming down, there was no way I was going to let them go out. But we were in there a long time. We knew everything by the time we left. And you mean, did you mean students or yourself were receiving texts or other messages about what was going on? Yes. When you were back in your classroom, after you got the F back in, you could still hear loud uh, noises, correct? It was intermittent, yeah. It would start and then stop, and then start and then stop. Could you tell it was the same type of sound that you had heard when you were outside? Yeah, I mean, we weren't sure, like, because we were starting to figure out what was going on, but then we were all just trying to figure out, like, why, what? How come it's still happening? Like, what, why isn't it stopping? What's going on? We didn't know. Smoke that you saw, that was before the fire alarm went off, correct? Yes. So you never saw my client on the scene, correct? No. And after the fire alarm went off, did you get a chance to go back out and look at anything or you were in your classroom? Not until SWAT came to get us. Okay. And did you ever figure out like how it is that you couldn't wrap your head around the sound coming from inside the 1200 building? Did you ever think about that? It was just so loud and echoey, like everywhere. We just knew, I, you could tell it wasn't literally at the building, but you couldn't tell where it was just because it was so loud. Okay, you mentioned echoey. Was yeah, it would bounce, I guess, the sound bounced off the buildings because it makes a triangle, like a rectangular shape of buildings right there. So I guess that's what's happening, I don't know. Okay, thank you, Ms. Kahn. I wish you the very best. Based on any of that, any Yes, sir. Very good. Go ahead. Ms. Campbell, you, you described it as echo, correct? Yes. Yeah. Um, you still looked at the 1200 building at the windows, though, the direction of where? Yeah, I looked over the ledge, definitely. And it drew your attention to the windows as the building spoke. So even with all this echo, you could kind of tell the vicinity of where the shots were coming from. Or the noise was coming. Yeah, at that time I didn't know what it was, so I just looked over and then movement caught my eye, so. And that corresponded with what you heard? Yes. Nothing further. Mr. Drybush is a witness excused. Yes, sir. And you may step down. Thank you very much. While she's doing that, defense, you may call your next witness. Thank you, Your Honor. Defense calls Tyler Garbo. Thank you. Please be seated. And once you're 
your seat. If I could just keep that chair all the way up as far as it will go. Can you please state your full name and spell your full name? Uh, my name is Tyler Darbo, T-Y-L-E-R-D-A-R-B-O-E. Mr. Agarsh, you may. Thank you. Mr. Darbo, would you prefer that I call you Tyler or Mr. Darbo? Uh, sure. Tyler is fine. Uh, okay, fair enough. Um, are you in school right now? I just graduated in May. And where did you graduate from? Uh, Florida Polytechnic University. And what did you study? Uh, computer science and uh, AI. And were you a student at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas ever? I was. Were you a student back on February 14th, 2018? Yes, I was a junior. And what class were you in when something unusual happened that day? Uh, I was in Mr. Sanders' pre-calculus class. And where is his class located? It is in the building across from the 1200 building. I believe that is the 700 building. Can I show you a photograph? and see if you're able, and I'm not sure if the slide comes through, but if you could just take a look at this, and I'm showing you what has been marked as Defense Exhibit E. Do you, are you able to see at least approximately where your class would be located? Um, it's not on this picture, it'd be on the other side of the building, at the, all the way on okay, the right so side. further down here? Uh, well, it's on the side facing the courtyard. It's okay. not on the side facing the building. Got it. And is that, do you know, if, if the football field is on the west side, do you remember where the football field is located? Yes. Is your classroom closer to the west side? It's closer to the east side. Closer to the east side of the 1200 building, correct? Yes. Okay. Were you on the first or second floor? The second floor. Now, before the fire alarm went off, do you remember what you were doing? Uh, we were taking an exam, a quiz. Uh, we were taking some exam. That class. And, and then did you hear the fire alarm go off? Yes. Tell us what happened. So after the fire alarm went off, we did what we normally do for fire alarms and go out the door to the left and then go to the stairwell that's on the east side. And that stairwell, would that have been closest to the east or to the west? To the east. Okay. And what happened next? So after we went over to the stairwell to the east, there was two gentlemen that walked up the stairs and was telling us that it wasn't a drill, um, but none of us knew what was happening. The teachers at the time were telling us to go back down the stairs for our normal fire, fire drills. And that's when I looked over the edge and saw uh, Scott Peterson. How close were you to Scott Peterson? I was right above him, probably no more than five to 10 feet. Okay, and what did you see him doing? Uh, he was just sitting there against the stairwell uh, unholstering his weapon. Okay. You saw I'm sorry, him. I'm sorry. He was just unholstering his weapon. Thank you. Okay. Had you heard any shots up to that point? No, we have not heard anything. All right. What happened next? So after that, uh, me and my teacher, when, after we looked over the edge, we then started to walk back to the classroom. He was ushering everybody. I over. forgot to ask you one question. When you see him unholstering his weapon, do you see him looking in any particular direction? Uh, he was looking towards the west side, which I believe is where the football field is. Okay, he was so looking, looking down in that direction, correct? Yes. All right, and what happened next? Um, after we looked over the edge, we then were walking, he, uh, our teacher at the time told us to walk back to the classroom, and that's when we started to head back. And then what happened? Uh, as soon as we rounded the corner is when we heard about three to four shots. And what did those sound like? They were just, they sounded a lot like firecrackers. Uh, we didn't know what it was at the time, but it was just loud pops. And that's when, you know, that's as we were going back to the classroom. And how many did you hear about? About three to four. Okay. And then what happened? Um, then we just went back to the classroom and then hid in the corner. All right. Let me go back to when you hear those pops. Mm -hmm. okay. How close would you estimate at that point you are to Scott Peterson? Uh, I, I don't know the exact distance, but it's around 30 to 40 feet. Okay. And... When you heard those shots, where did you think that they were coming from? They, so the stairwell that's on the west side of the 700 building, that's where it generally sounded it was coming from. Okay. But so did you ever think that they were contained within a particular building? Uh, no, I, I just knew the direction that it was coming from. Okay. Did you ever say, gosh, there's shots being fired inside of the 1200 building? No, I just knew that it was coming from the west side stairwell. And you thought it was the west side stairwell of the 700 building, correct? 
I, I just knew it was coming from that direction. I didn't know where it was. You've learned in retrospect that the shots were actually inside of the 1200 frame, correct? Yes. Did you ever think back and wonder why it is that you thought that the shots were coming from west and outside? I have not just thought about why it was coming from that side. Have you ever had experience with echoes in that area? Uh, it does echo quite a bit. It's Explain to the jurors your experience about that. Um, I mean, it is a hallway outside. There's a lot of concrete that's around the buildings. The walls are flat. Uh, and someone can drop a textbook and it will echo throughout. You can hear it pretty clearly throughout the hallway. So before the shooting, you had experienced times where loud noise will take place and then you don't know where the where noise is coming from. Correct? You know the direction where it's coming from, but you can't pinpoint its exact location. Okay. I wish you the very best. Thank you. Cross-examination, go ahead. Yes, Your Honor. Tyler, how are you doing? I'm doing good, how are you? Not too bad. Um, as I tell every witness, I speak pretty quickly. If you need me to slow down, just let me know, okay? Okay. Now, I want to show you a The 700 building would be this building right here. Now, your class was on the south side, so facing kind of the courtyard. Yes. With the, I changed it. Oh, can you just mark with a, a circle where the courtyard is? Uh, the courtyard is right here. Okay. Now, where approximately was your classroom? It was about right here ish. So, when you leave that classroom, and if you want to maybe change it to green or purple, just for clarification. When you left the classroom on the fire drill, what route did you take? So as we came out the classroom, we walked up here into the stairwell that's right up, right there. Now this stairwell right here, when you said that you looked over the edge, were you looking north over the ledge, or is it east or west? What direction were you looking over the edge? Just north over the ledge. Okay. So if you continue with that purple line up to <coughs> kind of where that white part is, that's where the ledge is that you were looking over? Yes. Okay. And if you could, can you just mark with an X uh, approximately where you saw Mr. Peterson? I saw him right around here-ish. Okay. And you said you saw him unholstering his gun? Yeah, he was on the wall. He was on the wall. Did you see him actually taking that out of the holster, or did he already have it in his hands? It was very quickly that I looked over. Okay, so that's actually my next question. For how long would you say you saw him? You can estimate this. Probably no more than a second, a second to a couple seconds. Now you said that he was facing, it looked like he was facing west towards the football field, right? Yes. Was his body facing west or was it just his, his head? It, uh, I don't really remember. Okay. And I know you just testified it, it was only a second, so if you don't want to hear something, that's fine. But did it look like he was scanning or did it look like he was intent, like focused on the west side? It, I just saw him looking to the west side. Okay. You're walking back, so basically just tracking back on the purple line that you're already drew. You heard three to four shots. Yes. I 
Had you ever heard a gunshot before in your life, in real life? No. And at that point in time, you were about 30 or 40 feet from Mr. Peterson? Uh, about. Can I don't you know just change it to green for me? And once again, mark approximately where you were when you heard the shot. I was about here-ish when I started to hear the shots. So right at the corner? Yes. Now, you stated on, on uh, direct examination by Mr. Ardbush that you knew the direction that it was coming from. Mm -hmm. Which direction was that? Uh, it sounded like it was coming from the west side stairwell. Do you want me to mark it on the? Yeah, sure. Uh, so it was about, I believe the stairwell is right here. So it sounded like it was coming from that direction. And where, and I'm going to zoom out a little bit, so I'm just going to erase this. Or you have to actually erase that. I don't have any control. Uh, you know what, don't worry. Exercise. Exercise. <laughs> The senior lot is at the north side. You, you can mark it. Okay, so the senior lot is here. It's that entire parking lot. Did you at any time think the shots were coming from that direction, the senior lot? I, I just knew it was coming from that area. I didn't know where it was. So in that direction, yes, but not. I didn't know if it was in the senior lot or not. Okay, so you, earlier you marked, and you can just mark again if you will, um, the west stairwell on the 700 building. So the west stairwell is here. Okay. So it could have been from the west stairwell, but it also could have been from the senior lot. Yeah. Senior lot is north of you? Yes. And the building between you and the senior lot is the 1200 building? Yes. You mentioned on direct examination about that echo in the hallway. That was kind of like a known thing. And if someone dropped a textbook, you would kind of hear the echo. Mm -hmm. Is that a yes? I'm sorry, yes. Oh, sorry, yes. Yeah. So it was widely known that hallways weren't necessarily the best place to stand if you're trying to determine where a sound came from, were they? Yeah. They would, they would not be the best place. They wouldn't be the best place, yes.
spell your full name? Jeffrey Morford, J-E-F-F-R-E-Y, M-O-R-F-O-R-D. Mr. Agos, your name, please. Thank you. Mr. Morford, are you currently working? No, sir, I'm retired. And what are you retired from? I was uh, assistant principal at Stoneman Douglas. And how long were you in the uh, school system? I was in Broward schools 21 years, I believe, overall 33 years in the public school. And did you ever work for Marjorie Stoneman Douglas? For six years. Six years? And during that time, did you ever have contact with Scott Peterson? I did. Tell the jurors what type of interaction you had with him. I would interact with him daily. He uh, would help me anytime I had issues with parents, students, anything in, in that nature. Uh, we, would, we even shared duties together, at, like lunchtime and things like that. So I spent a lot of time with him. Your, your title was assistant principal, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. And what was his relationship like with the kids? He had a good relationship. I felt like that uh, we were able to stop some things from happening because kids had confidence to come and talk to him, to share things with him. And uh, he had a good rapport with, I, I believe, administration, staff, and students. Were there times where there were any fights on campus? We had a few. And did you ever see um, Scott Peterson get involved and try to stop those fights? He would always, he would always jump in and help, always. Were there times he would do that even without backup? Correct. Did you ever see any acts at all that would lead you to believe he was a coward in any way? No, Objection sir. sustained, Your Honor. No, that's overruled, and he already answered the question. Go ahead, sir. Ask your next question. Sorry. And if there were arrests that needed to be made at school, would you call upon Scott to investigate and make those arrests if necessary? Correct. On the day in question, um, do you recall the fire alarm going off? I do. And tell us uh, what happened. I remember I was in my office. Uh, Where was that? I was in the 100 building. Okay. And uh, I went to the uh, I went to Deputy Peterson's office. The fire alarm was in there, and someone was already in there working with it. So I remember I came back to my office and eventually I, I went outside to, to start, you know, helping with getting kids, you know, with the fire alarm. When you went into his office, was he in his office at that point? I don't recall that. I don't, I don't recall that. Okay. And then what happened next? What did you do? Um, then I eventually went out to the hallway um, and started, you know, getting kids. I, I, my, my uh, area to take care of was right there by the main 100 building in the auditorium. So I went that way. I eventually ended up down toward the auditorium area, um, headed toward the 1200 building. I didn't get near that far down, but in that direction. And, and I eventually ran into uh, office monitor Stobley who informed me what was going on. And uh, so I headed back to try to start, you know, because kids were all coming down for the fire, thinking it was a fire drill. And uh, so we had to, uh, we were trying to get them in the auditorium and get them back up the stairs to back to their classrooms. Were you equipped with a school radio? Yes, sir. Do you know approximately how many people had a school radio? A lot. A lot. I mean, not just administrators, people no. like custodians. Right? Correct. All co campus monitors, uh, custodians, even de some department heads. So there was a lot of radios on campus. Okay. Do, do you always hear every transmission over the school radio? No. Tell the jurors how come you don't always hear every single transmission that's made over a school radio. People can walk on top of each other. These weren't like real high-tech um, radios. So for instance, maybe if I was talking and someone pushed a button, that would, they wouldn't even have to be talking. They could just push the button and it would cancel out you know, what I was saying. Um, it just, a, a lot of different things could, could keep them from being where you hear everything. Did you 
you ever miss any transmissions during your six years, for example, at that school when you have divided attention, like you're talking to someone or you're researching on your computer? Anything like Most that? definitely, and especially if like I would have someone in my office, if I had a parent or a student, I would a lot of times turn my radio down. Just, I, I would, you know, not off, but down, and so you could definitely miss things. What is a code red? Immediate danger, uh, lockdown, need to get, get to safety. When someone orders a code red, whose benefit are they doing it for? Staff, students. And what are teachers instructed to do when a code red is ordered? They're to secure their room and secure their kids in, in the room. That's if they can get into the room. Correct. So let's talk about when there's a fire alarm going off. Are teachers supposed to bring their keys outside of their classrooms? They should, yes, they should secure their classroom when they're leaving for the fire drill. They should take their appropriate things with them and, uh, and secure their door and then be able to let the kids back in when they're finished. Okay. Did there come a time where you heard someone order a code red on February 14, 2018? Yes, I heard Deputy Peterson call code red. And are you familiar with his voice? I spoke with him daily. How often, just so that they're clear? In the six years you were there, did you speak to him every day? Daily. Sorry. Were there times when you speak to him more than once a day? Most definitely. Do you recognize his voice? Most definitely. When you heard him order a code red, was there any doubt in your mind he's the one who did so? No doubt in my mind. Now, as a, as a result of him ordering a code red, did you do anything over the radio? I. That's where, I, and, and I apologize, some of my dealing with all this, I've had some issues and I, memory's been one of them, but I don't specifically remember him calling Code Red, but I know another assistant principal in his statement said he heard me call Code Red. So I don't, in the chaos of what's happening, I don't remember it myself, but another person did in his statement say that he heard me call. But if you did order that code red, would it have been because my client ordered the code red? One hundred percent, because I heard it from him first. Was there a time that you went to the video room to review surveillance video? Correct. After, like I said, I had met Coach Stavely, and and we were going back, and and Deputy Peterson got on the radio and asked me to go to the camera room to try to locate what was going on. Do you remember him telling you specifically to go to the camera room to try to locate the shooters? Correct. And would you have gone to the video room had he not told you that? No, I probably would not have thought of that. I would just been trying to get kids in to safety. And who did you go to the video room with? Mr. Greenleaf, the, our security specialist. And between you and him, who knows how to operate the equipment in the video room? He does. I, I did not know how to operate it. And while he was on the equipment, what were you doing? I was on the radio. I was sitting beside him. He was like in an area like this where the computer screen was, and I was sitting like beside him. And were you speaking with anyone on your school radio? Deputy Peterson. And how long did this go on, if you can give an estimate, just ballpark? It wasn't like very briefly. We, we had to rewind the film, and then... When, when we first rewound the film, it was like just smoky, like, a, you know, we couldn't really see much. And so we started back and then we, I was on, as, as we saw things, we were reporting it to him. So it was, it wasn't like five minutes, five, 10 minutes, at least at that, at that. At least, so you, you can't give it a total ballpark, I but can. at least five to 10 minutes. Correct, we were, I was on, I was on with him at least five to 10 minutes for sure. Okay. But that, that's not your ballpark, right? No, right. You're saying that would be the minimum? Correct. Are you able to give like a maximum time? I don't know. But everything was happening so fast, I, I don't know. Was there ever a time during that, again, you called it a long process, right? Is that a yes? Yes. Was there ever a time that Deputy Peterson ever hang up or gave up on the process? No, never. Did it seem like he was trying to find out in real time where the shooter or shooters were located? Yes. That was your purpose with him? Correct. Did my client have any control over the video and, and where it was being rewound to? No. If 
you did learn at some point that Mr. Greenleaf didn't rewind it properly, and so you weren't actually giving the right information, correct? We knew it was delayed, correct. It was not live. But whatever information that Greenleaf was giving you, you were conveying that to my client, correct? Correct. Did you understand that he was then disseminating that information to those on the scene? That Deputy Peterson was? Yes. We assumed he was, yes. Okay, thanks. That's all I have. I thank you for coming this morning. Cross-examination, go ahead. school together we were that I was I would definitely consider him a friend. <laughs> now Deputy Peterson, your testimony has ordered or told you to go to the camera room, correct? Correct. And you're with Kelvin Green. I wasn't with him at the time. I I headed there and I don't recall exactly where I ran into Kelvin, but somewhere we ran into each other and, and we went into the main building. And you said on, on, on direct that you have some memory issues related to this incident, correct? Correct. Is that the, the trauma associated with it? Yes, sir. Okay, so you remember some things, you don't remember other things. Correct. And that's why I tried to go back and look at some of my statements so I can remember things because okay. I have a lot of depositions. Do you remember Mr. Peterson tell you, telling you over the when you're in the video room to look directly or look at the 1200 foot? I don't recall that. Is it possible he told you that? I, I don't recall it. Again, Mr. Greenleaf was the one that went in and got on the camera and, and got it going. I was just, I was there watching. You were there watching and relaying the information? Correct. Now you took part in code red drills, correct? Correct. The class is taught by the school board uh, employee? Correct. And Mr. Peterson was part of that? I, I don't know. You don't know I mean, who was part of it? Because we would have it in the auditorium, it would be big. Sometimes because of things we'd have going on, we, as an administrator, I would be in and out of the meetings. I couldn't maybe sit there the whole time, so I, Honestly, couldn't tell who was there, who was not there. Typically, with these meetings, though, the SRO, the head of security on campus, would be there, right? You don't remember? I don't know that. Now, you testified on direct that uh, Deputy Peterson uh, called the code red. Correct. Isn't it true that Elliot Bonner is the first person to call code red? I never heard C Coach Bonner call code red. And today, you're stating that it was definitely Deputy Peterson that called the program. Correct. Notes here. Have you ever testified differently? I, I tried to go back and look at all my depositions. So not that I'm aware of. Not that you're aware of. Um, would there be anything that might refresh your recollection? Possibly.
sworn statement on August 22nd of 2018 for Detective Bonasaro? I, no, I don't remember. Might something to refresh your recollection? Please. Um, may I approach? Sure. So, so the point of exercise here, just read whatever the document is the lawyer wants you to read. Read it for yourself, take your time. Uh, when you're done, if you look up, I'm sure the attorneys will have questions for you. What I don't want you to do is read out loud from the document. Sure. Just read it for yourself and see if that refreshes your memory, okay? Saying that I don't remember. You don't remember a recall program back on August 22nd, 2018. I'll show you the date. Correct. Okay, so this happened in February 14th of 2018. Correct. So it's approximately six months later, and you don't remember who called you. Okay. But today, because we're in a courtroom on June 21st, 2023, suddenly Mr. Peterson called the program. Correct. Well, again, I, I tried to go back and look at all my depositions, and, and I know in several of my depositions I said that Deputy Peterson called Code Red. And that's, I'm, again, because of memory, I'm trying to go back and look at what I said because the farther back to that date would have been, I believe, I would remember. Would you agree that you would remember closer to the date that it happened than today? Correct. Correct. And the other depositions, do you recall when they happened? Approximately, I'm not going to look at the date. I mean, I had one, two days after the incident. I've had what, a lot. Including up to April 26th of 2022? Correct. Now, you also called a code red, correct? I don't remember, but... Another assistant principal said he heard me calling. Now, with the school radio, as Mr. Eibarth was asking, sometimes you heard transmission, sometimes you would uh, turn it down if you were in a parent meeting. Did you overhear Coach Feist that day? No, I did not. Did you overhear uh, Campus Monitor Medina that day? I don't remember. stated under direct that the fire alarm was in Mr. Peterson's office. What, what does that mean? That's where we would turn it off. So the, like the master so, switchboard is Yes, sir. Right. Yes, sir. And that's, is he the SRO, the head of the security? I mean, I don't, I don't know why. It's just that's where it was. Now, you described uh, on direct examination that he had a good relationship with kids. Um, he was like a mentor to them? I think so. You saw it. It's a, it was a different relationship. It was almost like a relationship that a student may have with a teacher or an administrator. Correct. Now, you testified on, on direct that you had to switch to the operating camera. Why did you do this? That's where, my, that's where my duty is for fire drill. Okay. Now, as you headed towards the auditorium area um, from, the, from building one, that's heading north, kind of towards the 1200. Correct. You ran into <clears throat> Brian Stobble, who's a campus monitor, and he called you over Zoom. Correct. Did you hear any shots that day? Again, I don't recall that at all. Now, you said that you were trying to get the kids back in the classroom. Is that correct? After I saw Coach Stobble, correct. And is that to try to protect the kids? Correct. Now, in Code Red Drills, what is, the, what is an assistant principal's job? Our job is to seek shelter and for just you, for everyone. So you 
did your job that day by trying to get the kids in to Texas. Was trying to, correct. Was trying to. Now, on direct examination, <coughs> the question was asked about that Mr. Green was in the video and that Mr. Green was incorrectly in the video. That's not what happened, though, right? I don't know what you mean by incorrectly. Well, that was the word, that was the question that was asked. Did Kelvin Green make you incorrectly? Okay, no, I, I, I'm saying that it wasn't live. We had to rewind it. So Mr. Green did it properly, he just couldn't see what was on the screen. Could you see what was on the screen? Because you were watching videos, right? Correct. Not at, at, at the beginning, as I, I thought I stated, it was just all cloudy. So it had to be rewound Correct. to see what happened. Correct. I've tried to forgive a lot. Understood. I understand. People don't realize what we went through that day. So as you're asked questions today, you're basing a lot of it off the transcripts. Um, I'm sorry, the deposition of Casey Baggage. Yes, sir. Do you I, have a good independent recollection of what actually happened, separate from the statements that she read? I'm not sure I understand if the question. If you think about February 14th, 2018, can you remember in your brain and mind what happened? Or is it just based upon what you're reading, the sworn statements you previously gave? Yeah, I think it's a combination of both. He's doing that, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to do a quick restroom break. Same admonition as always. Please do not discuss the facts of the case, the evidence, the witnesses, or the testimony until we reach the end of the case. I'll tell you when that is. If you leave the notepads in your chairs and step in the back one moment, I'll be right back with you. Thank you. We're outside the presence of the jury. A real quick five minute restroom break. We'll be in recess for five minutes.
have 10A. I continue to have Ms. Gomes, Mr. Killer, and Mr. Klinger present for the state. I continue to have Mr. Aguilar present with Mr. Peterson, who likewise is present. We are outside the presence of the jury. State, anything you need me to address before we resume with the no, defense presentation? No, Your Honor. Defense, anything you need me to address? No, Your Honor. How many more witnesses do we have? We, um, we have three here. Don't know if we're going to get to all of them today. We're just doing our best. Okay. Not a problem. And then uh, did you all have a discussion about what your preference would be for tomorrow? We did, Your Honor. We <laughs> kind of deferred to one another. But if I told Mr. Aguilar if the 1230 time works for his clients and it would work for the rest of the afternoon, that would be my personal preference, but whatever the best is. Yeah, I just don't want you to have to wait on them. You know, you want, to, you want me to give the jurors tomorrow morning off until they eat lunch on their own and come back at 12, resume at 1230 tomorrow? That's fine. Any objection to doing it that way? No, that's fine. Okay, thank you, Mr. When are you finished your time? After we finish tomorrow by 11 15, please. Oh, okay. So we will have the normal one hour and 15 minute lunch break. We get over by the end of the hour. That's the average. Do you have your school? The judge. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Come on in. Ladies and gentlemen, once you are back at those same seats, you may be seated. All the parties may be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, those of you using the notepad, I will give you a moment to get the notepads back out. Gentlemen, when we took our uh, restroom break, we were in the middle of the defense presentation. We're going to resume at that point. Defense, when you are ready, you may call your next witness. Thank you, Your Honor. The defense next calls Melanie Weber. Melanie Weber, please. If I could have you come all the way up here to the witness stand, please. Once you reach it, before you have a seat, if you can just stop and look at me. Raise your right hand, please. Just for the tell the truth, whole truth, nothing but the truth. Yes. Please be seated. And once you are seated, if I can get you to scoot that chair forward as far as it will go, can you please state your full name and spell your full name? 
Uh, yes, uh, Melanie Weber, M-E-L-A-N-I-E-W-E-B-E-R. Two B. Oh, one B. One B. One B. Yes. Understood. Mr. Agarash, you may inquire. Do you prefer that I call you Melanie or Miss Weber? Melanie is fine. Okay, Melanie. Um, do you work? Are you in school? I just graduated from Florida State. Congratulations. Thank you. And what was your major? Biology. And what are you studying to become? I just applied to med school. Okay. Yeah. And did you ever attend Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School? Yes. Back on February uh, 14, 2018, the day of the shooting, what class were you in? I was in Ms. Hertzfeld's drama class. Okay. And what building was that in? The 700 building. Okay. Let me show you a photograph of a portion of the 700 building and ask if you can identify where your class was. Oh, um, it, I can't reach it. It's like the, that door right there. Or no, this one. Okay. So it w it's to the, I guess, to the closest to you next to the tree, correct? Oh, oh yeah. That's Would the it tree. be right the other side of this pole? Is yes, that another yes, way to say it? That's the door. Okay. That's on the first floor, correct? Yes. And what kind of class was Ms. Hertzfield? It was a drama class. And were you one of the ones participating in that musical they had going there? Yes. All right. And then what happens next? Um, so we were rehearsing for our spring show, and then um, the fire alarm went off. Um, and so me and a bunch of my friends in the drama room uh, responded to it like we would any other uh, fire alarm, and we walked outside um, in response to it going off. And if you can show us on that same photograph what your path was. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so we walked out the door and started crossing this patch of grass kind of diagonally over to the parking lot where we usually gather uh, for fire drills. Show the jurors where the 1200 building is. Uh, right here. So is your classroom facing the 1200 building? Yes. Are you right across from the 1200 building? Yes. And what <coughs> happens next as you're walking? As we were walking, I, I want to say we were in, right in the middle of this grass patch. Um, that's when we heard the gunshots. Okay. And how many did you hear? Um, a, around seven. Did you recognize them as gunshots right away? No. What did you think that they were? At first, um, I thought that they were um, firecrackers or some kind of explosive. And what did you do in response? Um, we immediately turned around and ran back into our classroom. Okay. And how were you feeling in that moment? Um, scared. Okay. And when you heard the shots, as you indicated, between the 12th and the 700 building where you identified, where did you think that they were coming from? Um, since it was so loud and the sound was echoing and reverberating off of all the buildings, um, I initially thought that they were coming from the soccer field. Okay. Let me show you what is marked as Defense Exhibit F. Can you show the jurors If this is the 1200 building and this is the 700 building, yes. where would the soccer field be? Uh, over there. Okay. Is the soccer field also used as a football field? Yes. Okay. Now, that area is very, very west of the 1200 building, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is that a yes? Yeah. That noise yes. you can't make. Sorry, that. sorry, yes. And did you ever think that the shots then were contained inside a particular building? No. Did you ever think that those shots were coming from the 1200 building? No. And did you ever see my client on the scene? I, I believe I did. Okay. And do you remember anything about seeing him there? I, yes, I, um, and I, I don't know if my memory is 100% accurate, but I remember when I walked out into the patch of grass in between the freshman building and the 700 building, I saw him um, kind of on the side of the freshman building facing the parking lot. Mm -hmm. 
I, I believe there might have been a golf cart that he was getting out of, and it seemed like he was, I don't know, run, running towards it or something okay. like that. All right. Anything else that you recall? Um, I, I feel like I remember him, um, I don't know, maybe I don't know, hit the gun or reach, reach for it or something like that. Okay. I don't know. My memory isn't. It was five All years right. ago. <laughs> so. so you believe you might have seen him reaching for the gun, but you're not sure. Right. Yeah. Okay. And you had mentioned the word echo or echoey. Mm -hmm. Is that what you said? Yes. Okay. Tell us what you mean by that. Um, I don't know. Just, just echoing. Um, had you experienced that before the shooting ever, where you hear a loud sound in that area and you're not sure where the sound is coming from? Uh, no, I don't think so. Okay. So, but on the day in question, you described it as echoey, correct? Yes. And can you describe the configuration of the buildings which might cause that? Um, all of the buildings at Stoneman Douglas are kind of, uh, Stoneman Douglas, even though it's made up of multiple buildings, it is just kind of like a big square. So there are a lot of courtyards and a lot of, I don't know, walls that sounds could just bounce off of because especially in the patch of grass where I was, I was right in between two buildings and then there are more buildings over here. So it's just, an, I don't know, an area where the noise can bounce off. Got it. I thank you very much and good luck with that school. Yeah, thank you. Cross-examination, go ahead. I'm good, how are you? Not too bad. I tend to speak pretty quickly. If you need me to slow down, just let me know. Okay. I'm going to show you a picture. I'm going to show you what's already in evidence. This is States uh, 17. And your screen is actually a draft. So what that means, you this can go to everybody. Yes, sir. You can mark uh, when I ask certain questions. You can actually okay. use the pencil function. So I know that Mr. Eigler showed you a picture of where your classroom was. Looking from that mm -hmm. area, do you recognize where the 700 building is? Um. Yeah. Can I draw it? Yeah, please. Okay. Right, is it next. Uh, yeah, this one right here? Ooh, okay. That right there. Now, approximately, looking from the aerial view, where would you say your classroom was? Um, right here. Okay. And when you came out of the classroom, if you could just maybe change colors, whatever color you want, you see on the bottom. Okay. What was the tra track? Like, where did you go? Um, okay, is this sidewalk in the middle new? Because... Okay, okay. Just because I'm kind of confused by the, the image because I just remember this all remember, being grass. Let me see this then. Do you remember the 1200 building? Yes. Okay, do you see the 1200 building? Yes. Okay. okay. So, so looking at, well, let me show you in the Martian dome. I just knocked it over. So do you see that concrete? Okay, dome? yeah. Sorry, that wasn't there when I went to school there, so I was just confused by the by the image. Okay, yeah. So I probably walked out here and got to around here. So you got to about there. Um, where, and if you could mark just with an X, approximately where was Mr. Peterson when you saw him? I want to say around here. Did you see him on that, the concrete area there? Um, I can't remember if he was um, on the concrete or on the grass, but I definitely remember him being in this general vicinity. Okay. Going back to the concrete, you said it wasn't there when you were in at NSD. Are you sure about that? Do you remember that? I don't know. It, it, it was five years ago. I mean, th this sidewalk was definitely here, but this concrete cutting through the grass here, I, I, I don't know if I remember that. Okay, but it could possibly have been. It's possible it could have been. I'm asking, is it possible? Uh, possible that I, I saw him. No, I'm, I'm just asking about the concrete, just the walkway. Is oh, it, it's possible, yeah. I just don't 100% remember. Okay. Because you said earlier on direct examination from Mr. Eyeglass, your memory's not exactly 100%. It happened a long time ago. Right. Yeah. Okay. So when you come out, you're uh, following the, the line up there, and that's when you heard the, the noises, correct? Yes. How loud were they? 
they were very, very loud. Um, I, I had never heard gunshots before, so um, it was, yeah, yeah, it was it was very loud. Um, at first, I, I thought that something was exploding. As soon as you heard those shots, did you immediately turn around and run back to Ms. Her Ms. Herzl's house? Um, it's interesting that you asked that because according to my memory, I think I was in shock at first trying to figure out what was going on because if someone was lighting firecrackers and that's what I, or like explosives and that, that was what I initially thought. Um, I don't know, I, I was just trying to take in my surroundings and figure out what was going on. I feel like I remember pausing and being like, what was that? And then um, saying to myself, I probably should run back into the classroom. But when I watched a recording, the surveillance footage, it seemed like I turned around immediately and ran back. So okay. I'm not sure. So, well, let me ask you this then. Was your concern when you heard that sound of let me get back to the classroom as quickly as possible? Was it your safety? Was that your first thought? Um, uh, yeah, yes. Was it, let me look around, let me see exactly where this, this is coming from? No. Were you focused on the 1200 building, for instance? Or are the shots coming out of there? No, I was, I, I, no, not specifically. Now, at some point in time, did you see uh, another uh, person standing next to Mr. Shears? Do you remember that? Yes, I, I did see another person. Do you remember his name? Um, I think Mr. Greenleaf. Okay. Yeah. And did you at any point in time see Mr. Greenleaf waving the students back into the 700? Yes, I did. Okay. That, that was um, when I was walking out before I heard the gunshots. I saw him waving at us, and I kind of stopped in my tracks because I was like, why is he waving at us? And that was when I heard the gunshots. Okay. Yeah. So, so the, you're walking out, you see Mr. Greenleaf waving, gunshots, mm -hmm. immediately run back. Yes, that's correct. And you said you heard what you remember to be seven shots. Um, around that okay. number. More than two or three? Yeah, yeah. When you turned around to run back to the 700, did other students join you and also running back in that direction? Yes. And that's running away from the 1200 building? The direction of the 1200 building. Yeah, running away from the direction of the 1200 building. And you testified on direct examination that you saw, um, you believe you saw Mr. Peterson kind of on the side of the building, but you weren't sure. Yes. Which way was he facing when you saw him? He was facing the freshman building. And you said he may have, might have had his gun. Yes. Did that cause any alarm in your brain? <laughs> uh, I honestly don't know. Um, because I, I think I saw Mr. Greenleaf <clears throat> waving before I, I noticed, you know? Um, yeah, before I noticed that. So was your attention on Mr. Greenleaf and then? Yes, yes. Like, glanced at Mr. Peterson, then heard the loud noise. Yes. So it happened very rapidly. Yes, that, that sounds like the accurate sequence of events. Okay. Okay. All right, no further for this witness. Thank you. Based on that, any redirect? Yes, sir. Go ahead. <coughs> Just a few questions. On cross-examination, you said your memory is not 100% on all details, right? Yes. Because it happened five years ago, correct? Yes. This was very traumatic for you, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Did you give a statement to anybody many years ago? Um, like an official statement? Yeah. Did anybody come and give you a, a statement and find out what you knew? Um, no. Well, okay. yeah. I, I did talk to people in the, um, in the office but I, I don't think that was an official statement. Yeah, I'm referring to somebody like law enforcement sitting you down and saying, tell us what you know. Do you remember that? Okay, yeah, that did happen. Okay, many years ago, correct? Yes. Closer to the incident, correct? It was in the fall of my senior year, so six months after the incident, roughly. Okay. 
And while you say your memory isn't 100% on certain details, is it 100% on hearing what you thought was firecrackers? Yes. So is it is 100% on hearing what you thought were firecrackers coming from the soccer field? Uh, yes. Is it 100% on hearing what you thought were firecrackers from outside? Uh, yes. And was it 100% in your mind not coming from the 1200 building? Um, yes, um, yeah, I thought they were coming from everywhere, I really didn't know. Everywhere, yeah. correct? Thank you. Based on that, and your thoughts, just one variant of clarification. Go ahead. Um, on, when I was asking you a question, you called it the freshman building. Is the freshman building and the 1200 building the same building? Uh, yes, the freshman building is a nickname. Thank you. Is the witness excused? Yes, thank you. You may step thank down. You. Thank you very much. While she's doing that defense, you may call your next witness. Thank you, Your Honor. The defense next calls Deputy Brian Miller. Deputy Brian Miller. Sir, if I could have you come all the way up here to the witness stand, please. Yes, sir. Once you reach it, but before you have a seat, if you can stop and look at me, please. Yes, sir. Raise your right hand. You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. Yes, sir. Please be seated. Thank you. Sir, once you are seated, if I can get you to scoot that chair all the way forward as far as it will go. Yes, sir. If you could please state your full name and spell your full name. Brian Miller, B-R-I-A-N. Good afternoon, Mr. Miller. Are, how are you employed? I'm sorry, sir. How are you employed, sir? I'm a sergeant with the Broward Sheriff's Office. Okay. And how long have you been a sergeant with the Broward Sheriff's Office? I was promoted in 2004. 2004. And when did you start with the Broward Sheriff's Office? 1986. So you've got, I don't want to do the math, how many years do you have in it? A little over 36 years. And where are you assigned to today? Central Broward. And as a sergeant assigned to Central Broward, do you supervise any other officers? Not at this time, no. Okay. And I want to take you back to February 14, 2018. Do you remember um, learning that there was something going on at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas? Yes, sir. What drew your attention to that? A radio call came over by Deputy Peterson about uh, shots fired, possible fireworks. We heard that and that's when I started responding. Okay, so what caused you to go to the school was hearing my client make an announcement over the radio, correct? Yes, sir. You had no plans of going to that school but for his announcement, is that correct? Yes, sir. And do you go alone or with someone? I was by myself. And I mean, happened? there was other cars leaving the station at the same time. Okay, and what happened next? I was on my there, I was going lights and siren, which we refer to as code three. Um, Debbie Peterson then started closing off uh, like a perimeter of the area, not wanting vehicular traffic or pedestrians. And since Parkland has four cars, five cars normally, as a sergeant, I normally take perimeter spots for such things. So as I was crossing the main road, I slammed on my brakes to try to keep the cars because I had cars behind me that were normal people, not I mean, not law enforcement. Let me ask you, reporting shots fired or even possible shots fired as soon as you hear them, is that what you're trained to do? Yes. You're, I mean, as soon as you hear it, yeah, yeah. you call it out. Is there ever a, a training where they told you, you know, sit on it and wait and not report it right away? No, sir. Okay. And so tell us what happened next. Um, as I was pulling up, I, I heard several shots. Um, my window was open. I stopped. It 
it appeared to come from the football field from the sound that I heard. Let me, uh, let me just take it one step at a time. Sure. Um, had you stopped your vehicle before you heard the shots? I don't recall if I was still moving or stopped something. Okay. And where were you located when you heard the shots? Um, my car was going on the westbound side. If you were to look at the school, there are gates. One, it would have been one of the lock gates for the parking lot is. Okay. And would you be able to identify it on a map? Yes, sir. Which on the spot. But you, you think you might be able to do so? Yes, sir. Okay. I'm going to show you what is Defense Exhibit F. And if you take a good look at that. <coughs> First, just take a look at it. Let me know if you can kind of identify where it was that you were when yeah. you heard shots. Yes. Okay. Can you tell us where you were, sir? I was coming here, coming from here. I stopped. Okay. So to the right of the D in Holmberg Road, is that what yes, you're pointing sir. to? Yes. Okay. In that area. And that would have put you north of the 1200 building? Yes. Thank you, sir. How many shots did you hear initially? I don't remember. Several, but it could be three. I don't know. And could you tell where they were coming from? I thought it was the football field. And just so we're clear, if you can take a look at this again, where is the football field as you're relating it? Here. Somewhere over there. Yes. Okay. Did, did you believe that those shots were contained within a particular building or in an open area? I couldn't tell. It was, it was reverberating off the sound, and I couldn't tell where it, it just sounded to the west, and that's... Your word was rever rever reverberating. Yes, sir. You to say. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And what's the next thing that you did? From when I was heard the shots, I went to the back of my vehicle, to the right passenger. That's where my vest was. I put on my vest. Um, I took out my gun. I was trying to scan to see because at this point there was I didn't hear any more shots. I was asking Deputy Seward. Um, sorry, well, Seward, yes. S-E-W-A-R-D, who recently passed away. I'm sorry. I mean, had passed away. But anyways, he he was there, and I said, "Where did you hear the sounds?" And he was pointing towards the football field as well. Okay, so he corroborated your thought process that these shots were coming from the football field, correct? Yes, and then we heard stuff on the radio that made us even more so. That made you even what? I believe so, more so because Deputy Kratz, I believe it was, that called out that there was shots fired and he was in the football field. Okay, so let me just step back. Were you monitoring your radio on the way to Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School? Yes. And based upon that, did you have any real-time intelligence of precisely where the shooter or shooters were located? No. You are aware that VSO operates on a separate system from Carl Springs, correct? Yes, sir. Did you later come to learn that these radios were not patched with each other? I don't recall. I don't remember us ever being on the same channel with them, if that's what you're asking. I'm sorry. Okay. And... When you get to the scene, did you know whether you were looking for one shooter, two shooters, multiple shooters? No, we did not have that information. Are you trained that unless you have information telling you otherwise to believe that there could be multiple shooters on campus? Unless you have information, otherwise you don't know. And even though you thought the, shoot, the sounds were coming from the football field, do you say, okay, there must be just one shooter on the football field? No, sir. Tell the jurors what you were thinking in real time. It, well, you're at overload. You're, you believe that's where it is, and then I heard that there was a shooting victim in the football field as well. That's, again, just reaffirming my belief. When you arrive, do you just start running towards the football field or not? No, I, I block the traffic. I'm, I have, like I said, cars behind me. Um, I have uh, Deputy Hanks approaching. He's, because of the traffic backup, he's running on foot. And I'm yelling to him to go up further ahead of me where I see Goolsby and I think Perry. And I can't believe who the other ones were. We're already going inside the building. Or I'm sorry, not the building. The gate was approaching towards the, they were towards the west of me. 
I just want to make sure we heard you correctly. You didn't see them going into any particular building. You're no, no, the sir. Gate. No, they were going through the gate and it appeared, in my observation from, again, where I'm at, it appeared they were going towards the football field. And were you continuously trying to monitor your police radio to gather more real-time intelligence? I, you, of course, you monitor it all the time. I was trying to transmit the hangs and my radio wasn't working. Tell the jurors about that. What was wrong with your radio that day? When you key up, it would like make a sound like bonk, bonk, but as you were keying. Um, what is keying? Tell the jurors when what keying is. When you press the mic to talk into it for someone to hear, it would make a tone. But it would not only do you, you can't talk, you can't hear with it going over it. They refer to it as throttling, but I don't. For the fact, I can't tell you that's the term. That's what I was the term I was told it was, but it wasn't working. I mean, it, I would key up multiple times, and then occasionally it would work. And, it, and if you didn't speak when at that time it did work, you were you would go back to it, just doing that again. Right after you got out of your vehicle, did you put your vest on? When I went, to, yes, I went around to where my vest was and put it on. Yes, sir. And did you take a tactical position of cover? Yes, I was behind my vehicle. Explain to the jurors, um, are you trained to do that? Yeah, when the, if, at this point, you don't know where the shooter is. I took a position of cover behind my vehicle and looked and see to see where, if I could see where the shooting was coming from. But I he never you, fired again, so I didn't from there. Are you trained to have to wait for gunfire is coming right at you with certainty before you're taking a position of cover? No, I, I did it immediately. Well, I was putting on my vest so also. And I wasn't going to stand up and do it with, you know, in the open. And that's how they train you to do it now, correct? Yes, we, we're trained for cover. We practice shooting behind cover and concealment. Okay. And tell us how you're feeling. This is not, I mean, we're all calm in this courtroom, right? And how are you feeling today? Oh, yeah. How does how you're feeling today differ from how you were feeling when you're on that scene? Oh, you're, your heart's pumping. You're overwhelmed. It, it's, it's a lot. You're trying to take in a lot. And does that affect your ability to perceive things and perform effectively? I don't wouldn't know you as far as physically or mentally. Yeah, whatever, whatever. I'm just curious how it affected you. We're hearing. I just want to know what, how it affected you. I mean, you. it was, no, I mean, I don't know what to say. I mean, we were doing what we were doing. Okay. And... What happened, what happened next? You, you believe that it's coming from the football field. Yes. And then what else do you do? All right. Um, I tried to speak, uh, Hank. Um, I told Seward to see if he could get on the radio. I didn't know if it was my radio failing individually <coughs> to see if he could get more units to block where we were at so we were able. Um, I was calling for a helicopter. I was calling for canines. I had Coral Springs Police Department arriving to my location where I was at. Where did you want K-9 and a helicopter to go to? To my location, because as soon as we found out where we could track, I would then start from there, because since we've started a perimeter setup, um, that would be the next thing, because if he's in the football field, we would be tracking that direction. Okay. And other than you, do you recall who else was taking positions of cover by the football field? As far as cover, I couldn't, no. Seward was with me, um, but as far as far down, all I could see the officers going in. I didn't see any, at that point, anybody on cover. Did there come a time when you were on scene that you learned that Coral Springs Police Department was getting different information than BSL? Yeah, I found that out later, not, on, not during it, no. Okay. They came up and asked me about cutting a gate. Okay. About what? Cutting a gate. A lock on a gate, I'm sorry. And, and what happened next? What is the next thing that you do? Um, I tell them that I, where my guys are going in so we don't have an issue. And I said there's a gap between the buildings in front of the gate they were cutting. And I direct Seward to go with them so if we could get our radios back, at least we'd have ability to transmit, you know, where we're doing. But Did the way that the radios were failing you, did that hinder your abilities on the scene? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's you can't communicate back and forth. It's a, it's a, a problem. It's a safety issue. And, and, you, know, you can't warn you know, anybody where you're at. And, you know, it became a real difficult. It was very frustrating.
Did you ever have problems with the radio prior to that day? In Parkland, yes. Tell the jurors about the problems in Parkland. You could be in the station and they could call you and you wouldn't hear it on your radio. You could try transmitting on your radio. It just wouldn't work. You could be in different areas throughout the city that just the radio didn't work all the time. Did you complain to supervisors about the radio? Oh, yeah. They were aware of it. Matter of fact, I was trying to get them to put a repeater at the station at least so we would have more power. And how long did you remain in a position of cover? I stayed at that position because I was, as a sergeant, part of my job is the inner outer perimeter. So with a not working radio, I could at least see where people were responding and going and try to work from there. So do you have an estimation about how long you stayed in the position of cover? 20 minutes in my position, maybe. Okay. And was Officer Seward with you remaining in that position? No. He went in with Coral Springs when they cut the gate. I sent him with them. Okay. And did you ever go into the 1200 building? No. I was assigned a different task. Okay. And are you aware of Scott Peterson's performance as a professional? Yeah, I've worked with him before many times. Tell the jurors about that. Very professional. I believe, as a matter of fact, he was SRO or Detective of the Year a couple times. I worked details with him at the school probably four or five times that year. And he's very professional. Did you have any contact with him after the shooting? Yes, I ran him the following day at the crime scene. Not yet, because I thought we were... Go ahead. What's your next question? He answered your question for you. He ran into him the following day. What's your next question? Is there anything that you said to him? Yeah, I just said I thanked him for what he did, and he was very upset. He was, you know, he was very distraught over the whole issue, and I was consoling him. Okay. Thank you, sir. Cross-examination. Go ahead. Good afternoon, Sergeant. How are you, sir? I speak quickly. Do you need me to slow down? Just let me know. Yes, sir. I know you stated it, but I think I missed it. How long were you the sergeant in Parkland before 2018? I was there probably a year and a half. And who was your predecessor? Who did you take over? I don't know her name. Okay. I'm sorry. Whoever that sergeant was, did they, uh, they gave you a book about active shootings in, um, No, Lieutenant, Lieutenant DeVita gave me a book. Oh, Lieutenant DeVita did, okay. And in that book was kind of like a plan of action if there was an active shooting in Park. It had the, the policies, it had photographs, and the main, and then on some sheets had the inner, main intersections. Okay. With that information, you actually, um, met with Mr. Peterson at MSD to go over that information with him. Yes, but I had received the book. I was told as a new supervisor, I went to every um, school and to meet with the SRO. So you actually met with Mr. Peterson at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas? Yes. And you walked the grounds with him? Yes, he was, he was showing me around. And the purpose of that conversation was to discuss if, worst case scenario, an active shooting occurs, this is the plan. It was basically to familiarize me with the school, but to be honest with you, like, um, if there was an incident there, he says the best place for, like, the command post is actually where we put the command post of the shooting. He says this is where it should go. I mean, he showed me things, but the school is so big. I mean, to be honest with you, it was hard to remember the buildings as it was. But Mr. Peterson actually gave input into if, God forbid, an active shooting ever happened, this is what we should do. We, need to be a we didn't discuss what we should do as an active shooter. We had talked about an incident. I mean, we then talked about the operational location for the uh, command place. And that input was actually given by Mr. Peterson about where the... He, he suggested it, yeah. When you arrive, um, I'm going to show you a map, Your Honor, if that's okay, just to make sure. Sure. Jack, there is a Sam Beach column. Okay, Sergeant, that 
the screen is actually interactive, so you can actually mark uh, some of the things that we're going to do. Okay. Let me just zoom out. Let's move this through. Okay, so with the pencil function, you can actually utilize it. So when you got on campus, you testified under direct that you, not on campus, on your home. Yes. You slammed on your brakes. Yes. Where, where was that? Can you just mark that with an X? You, do I hit the pencil first? No, you're good to go. You can just mark it. Okay. Right. What about there? Okay. So that's kind of like the east side. But I'm on this, I'm sorry, I'm on this side of the road. Okay, so let me let me erase it. Let okay. me start over. Sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, let me mark it and you tell me if it's correct. Around, yes, sir. Around that. Yes, sir. So on the west side. Yes, sir. Okay. That's where you slammed on the brakes. Yes, sir. To block the intersection. Yes, sir. And that's after you heard over dispatch from Mr. Peterson to shut down the intersection. So yeah, I was, scared. I was, it doesn't have your map. I was further down, say here, according to where your map would be. Okay. Um, when he was called, that's when we were we're coming at a good speed, so that was my reaction time. Now, right. how does it work? You're, you're a sergeant who is a deputy. Yes. But in terms of an incident like this, the first responding officer, the first officer there can assume command, basically. Oh, I, he was the incident commander, without a doubt, yes. So even though you outranked him, he was calling the shots because he was there first. Yes. So when he told you, lock down the intersection, that's what you did. Well, I had, like I had previously said, we only have four or five cars in Parkland and this, it doesn't have a lot of cars. So when there's any type of a crime, any type of a burglary or robbery, I had to do that okay. just so we would be able to actually cover it. Because with four or five, it isn't, the perimeter typically would require more than four or five. Yes, sir. And now that's if everybody was available too at the time. Understood. Now, when you're on Holmberg Road over here, you thought the shots were from kind of like the football field, right? Yes. Or buildings around the football field? It, it could have been anywhere from this. Can I touch it? Yes, please. Okay. This building, all anything in here, this is where the sound I was hearing. Okay, so it was coming from the southwest of your position. Yes, because I'm, I'm knowing after the fact building, I am to the... Northeast of it, that corner. Northeast shots to the southwest, but you're yes, to sir. the northeast of where you think the shots are coming from. Yes, sir. It, now, when you arrived on the scene, how many shots did you recall hearing? I don't, didn't count them. It was several. I don't know. And those are the only shots you heard the entire time? Never heard any more. Okay, so you're there for a couple, or were you there, well, you were there for a couple seconds when the shots were I was pulling shots. up. I couldn't tell you if the vehicle was still moving or I had come to a complete stop. You were... Were you in the building when you heard the shots? Your window was down, right? My window was down. I don't recall if I was in, the, the door was open or not. I couldn't tell you. When you were in the car, yes. were you focused looking south towards the, with your head to the left, <laughs> looking south to the I, I was looking in my rear view mirror when I was making sure no one was hitting me because when I came to a very abrupt stop from a pretty fast speed. So when you heard those shots, you weren't looking towards the campus. You were looking No, the I just was hearing the sound. and where the sounds I like came from. And you, you never heard shots again that day? No, sir. Okay. Now we just discussed that the, the first deputy on scene is the, issues the commands. It's the person that has the most knowledge. It's not always the first deputy on scene, but I, de I would have, because he, it's being a school, he's familiar with the school, the locations and stuff. Until he's relieved by somebody else, he's the incident command. So he's, he's calling the shots, right? When you got there. Yes. Okay. And as the first deputy, you're the one with the most, that's the real-time intelligence, right? No, I mean, real-time intelligence is, is, I would have compared to what I, again, it's knowing after the fact. If I would have, the real-time intelligence would have been knowing the shooter was in what building where the victims were and all that. That would have been, a, that's different. Okay. But what we're getting is, as we're approaching, it's as it's developing. The person to whom you look for real-time intelligence, though, is for the deputies that are right there, right? I'm looking for anyone who has the information, whether if it was deputy people or with communications or with anybody, whoever can give me the updated as it was happening. Now, you also testified under um, direct examination that you, uh, the football field, you thought the shots were from the football field. Yeah, that's where I thought it was from, sir. You also heard Deputy Crass 
call out that there is a victim yes. shot near the football field. Yes. There were. Did that call out from Deputy Kratz play into why you thought it was over? That well, it, I'm sure it's all part of the, when you take in everything as your senses, it's not just one thing. I mean, that is part of it. Um, that's why when I requested for a helicopter and canine, we would be proceeding, and that that was my thinking that, okay, as soon, you know, once I have this set up and the dog gets there, we're going to start searching for the shooter. You know, you just, on direct examination, there were questions in regards to the radios um, brought up. Yes, sir. You heard the dispatch from, or the call out from Mr. Peterson about shots fired. I heard it from... Deputy Peterson saying yes. Yes, and you heard from Deputy Kratz about the football game. Yes. So you were hearing some in the beginning. Some of it, not everything, but yes. Now you testified that you saw Goolsby and Perry go inside the gate. Yes, they went through the gate and they were moving towards. Can you mark right. um, what gate you're talking about? Can is that right if I do it like that? It's, yeah. You can put it there. Yes. Okay. So the other entrance, the entrance that's west to that, there's a, a gate that closes off. The right. Road. And they were headed that kind of direction. Got it. And you actually could see them from where you were? Yes, I could see them going. And Deputy Seward is with you for when you first get there, correct? He's with me until Coral Springs goes into the other direction. So when Coral Springs is going, is heading down towards the east side of the 1200 building, you send Seward with them. With them. Can you just track their yeah, path? They went this way. Now, even though you're the sar you were the sergeant at uh, Parkland, you're not the SRO from Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, correct? No, I'm not the SRO. No, sir. Based upon the information from Mr. Peterson about locking down the intersection, did that play into why you stayed in that position for the period of time that you did? Well, my main reason was to stop the traffic and get that under control. I could see several vehicles in front of me knowing that we only have so many. I'm assuming most of my cars are there. Okay, so I don't believe there's anybody going to be right behind me. And if the shooter is out in this football field, I don't want cars and people going well along there either. I want to block it off. So is that coupled with Mr. Peterson telling you lock down that road? Yeah. Because if Mr. Peterson locked down Pine Island, which is you can see on the right side, it would. It would I, I would have stopped there if I could have stopped there in time. Stop where? I'm sorry. I, I would have stopped at Pine, uh, the Pine Island Road if, if that was feasible at the point. My going up as far as I did was just reaction time. I'm sorry. So for you, the time it took you to basically stop. Yes, sir. Car, the, you were in a squad car? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, how far would you estimate you were from the 1200 building? I'm over 100 yards from my car to the very corner of the building, I would, so I would assume. Now, on direct examination, you stated um, shots were never fired again, so I didn't move. What did you mean by that? Well, if I kept hearing shots, well, you would move the direction, but I didn't hear any more. So are you trained that when shots are fired, you move towards the sound of shots? Yeah, you're supposed to as you can, when you can. And if shots have stopped, then you collect real-time intelligence or look for other stimuli to act upon. You're trying to determine where, if you can. I mean, again, it, just because you have to determine where. And like, 
I would be very cautious on coming from where I'm at because I would be so wide open on the, how I would approach that. So does that mean that if you're right near the building, if you're 10 feet away from the building, you would be in a better position <laughs> to kind of go flush against the building as opposed to being 100 yards away? Calls for speculation. Yeah, that's the thing. Go ahead, sir. Ask your next question. On direct examination, you were asked if you uh, ever went into the 1200 building. You were said you were assigned a different task. What task was that? I went to set up the command post. And where on this did you set up the command post? I missed it. Um, can you check? Um, Oops, sorry. It oh. went to the line, but but at the end in, in the Pine Island Road. I changed it to green. Can you just mark with an X where the command post is set up? Okay, so actually on Pine Island Road. That's, yes. Okay. That's the command post where Mr. Peterson recommended if any, we should go we, down. We talked it would be on that road over in that area. But I wasn't the one that deemed it to be there, just so you know. I was signed to go there. You were signed to go there. Yes, I did not deem that to be it. The, then incident commander was Captain Dory. Captain? Jordan. Okay. One moment, Your Honor. Yes, sir. Based on that, we regret. Yes, Captain. Go ahead. Sergeant Miller, before you went to the, thank you, sir. Before you went to the command post, I think you said earlier you were in a position of cover for about 15 to 20 minutes, correct? Yes, I was over in that area. All right. And when my client locked down the school. Did you think that was a prudent action? Yes, this is. Objection, Mr. Peterson. That's sustained. Based on your training, do you believe that that was consistent with how you've been trained? Yes, during during an active shooter that locked down the school, yes. Tell the jurors why in this particular circumstance that would have been something consistent with your training. You don't want, you don't want any movement to go through the school. I mean, you want to secure the children or the people in the location where they're at. So if the shooter is out and about, it's less chance of getting more victims or targets. And while my client <clears throat> was the incident commander at first, I think you mentioned just briefly to the prosecutor that, um, is it Captain Jordan that took over? Yes, and then there was another one after that. Was that Colonel Poland? Yes, he was the last one. So when a higher ranking person arrives on the scene, they assume the role as incident commander, correct? Again, it was not only so much the higher ranking, but with the experience, I believe Colonel Poland was a SWAT team commander as well. So I think that's why he assumed that. And the highest ranking person who serves as incident commander is responsible for conducting the debriefing. Is that correct? Yes. The, no no, you're outside the scope. That's overruled. Go ahead, sir. You can answer the question. Yes, the incident commander should have done a debriefing. Were you ever debriefed? No, I conducted a debrief of my units that was assigned to my shift, but I was never debriefed by anyone. Why did you conduct a debrief of the people in your command? It's a common that's practice. Uh, no, that's overruled. Go ahead, sir. You can answer the question. It's a common practice when you go to a scene that's how you get better at responding to stuff by talking about what you've seen, what you observed, what you did. So you, we talk about it so the next time the similar event occurs, you know what everyone should do and what you expect each other. It's not just so much for the supervisor to direct them, it's the gentlemen on the ship and ladies on the ship that discuss it as well so they can talk about the different positions and responsibilities. I believe you told the prosecutor that hearing Deputy Kratz and others refer to the football field strengthened your belief. Yes, sir. That the shots were coming from the football field, correct? Yes, sir. But did you not tell me that when you arrived on scene and you initially heard those shots, without hearing anything from Kratz, you believed that they were coming from the, from football, the football field? From the football field, yes. So solely based upon the sound alone, before you hear anything on the radio, you believe that they were coming from the football field? Yes, correct? sir. And final question, there was nothing on the BSO radio that you were listening to that ever told you in real time that there was a shooter inside the 1200 building, correct? No, sir, never. So you didn't know that, that kids or adults were being killed 
No, sir. No, sir. Thank you, sir. Based on that, any recall? Yes. Go ahead. You just testified that there was no uh, dispatch call about shooter inside the 1200. I did not hear that. You didn't hear when Mr. Peterson said inside 1200 over dispatch. I thought you said, I thought the question was dispatch. I'm sorry. Did you hear Mr. Peterson say inside 1200? No, I don't recall. Uh, and at the time, I couldn't have told you what the 1200 building was. Also on, I guess, recross, um, you were asked about setting up the perimeter. The priority during a shooting is to stop the shooting gun and stop the bleeding, correct? It's not setting up the perimeter. Are you talking my responsibility? No, I'm talking or? about as a BS, any BSO. No, if you, if you have real-time shooter shooting, yes, you are to stop the shooter if you can. That's the priority, not stopping far as I believe perception. If you know where the shooter is, no, you're, you're right. Even if you don't know the shooter, if you hear shots, you go to the shots. If you know where the shots are, again, it'd be like if if I was a, not going to be responsible for the perimeter, I would have went towards the football field. If you heard shots. The ones I did hear. Okay. Nothing further. All right, is the witness excused? Yes, sir. Okay, sir, you may sit down. Thank you very much. While he's doing that, defense, you may call your next witness. Oh. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, a little quick uh, restroom break. Same admonition as always. Please don't discuss the facts of the case, the evidence, the witnesses, or the testimony amongst yourselves or anyone else. Until we reach the end of the trial, I'll tell you what that is. If you'll just leave the notepads in your chair, step in the back one moment, I'll be right with you. Thank you.
outside the presence of the jury. State, anything you need, need to address before we resume the recess for evening session? No, Your Honor. Mr. Hanson, anything you need me to address? No, Your Honor. Okay, please bring the jury back. gentlemen, welcome back to Monday. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Monday. Once you're back to those safe seats, you may be seated. All the parties may be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, when we took our quick restroom break, we were in the middle of the defense presentation. We're going to resume at that point. Defense, when you are ready, you may call your next witness. Thank you, Your Honor. The defense calls Maximo... Rosario. Maximo Rosario. Before you have a seat, if you need to stop and look at me, please can you raise your right hand. I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. Please be seated. And once you're seated, if I could just scoot that chair all the way forward as far as it will go. Can you please state your full name and spell your full name? My name is Maximo Rosario, M-A-X-I-M-O-R-O-S-A-R-I-O. Mr. Agarash, you may inquire. Thank you. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Tell the jurors what you do for a living. Currently, I work for Broward County Public Schools as a director of uh, technology support services. How long have you been with Broward County Schools? Around 24 years. And did you ever work at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School? I did. In what capacity? I was an assistant principal. And were you employed as an assistant principal on the day of this horrible shooting? I was. 
and tell us what your interaction was with someone that you knew as Deputy Peterson, Scott Peterson. Basically, I consulted with him whenever any law enforcement uh, event had to be involved. Uh, we engaged in any security matters that dealt with the school. And did you ever see him involved in, in breaking up any fights or disturbances? I did, yes. And tell the jurors about that. Basically, uh, if there were fights if, on occasion, you know, either in the cafeteria, hallways, courtyards, things of that nature, we always had all hands on deck, including Deputy Peterson at the time, who was uh, with us. Was there ever any tasks that you asked him to do that for whatever reason he chose not to? Not, not that I have any, no. Any incidents where you saw him evidence any kind of cowardice, you know, where he just didn't seem to be courageous? No. Just the opposite? The opposite to me, he always responded whenever I called. And you were an assistant principal at Marjorie Stone Douglas for how many years prior to the shooting? Over 10 years. Okay. So tell us about hearing the fire alarm. And we're talking about it was one earlier, correct? Uh, I believe so, but I don't recall. Okay. The one earlier, I, I believe there was, but I don't recall that particular alarm. But I know that in the afternoon I did hear an alarm. I was at guidance at the time, uh, going over some events from the previous nights. What building were you in? Building one. The 100 building. The 100 building, yes. All right, and tell us what happened. Uh, heard the fire alarm. I, I, I was not in my office, but I had left my, my uh, keys and my radio in my office. I went by my office, picked up my radio and keys, got on my golf cart, and uh, before I went into the golf cart, though, I went to the annunciator panel, which is where it tells us where the alarm was coming from. And the radio you had was a school radio? Yes. And numerous people have school radios. Yes. Correct? If you wanted to compile a list of all the people who have school radios, would that be something that could be done? Sure, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what's the next thing that you did? I went and took a look at where the panel, uh, the enunciator panel was, where the alarm was coming from. I identified as the 1200 building and I headed to go in that direction. Did you make any announcements of your school radio after? understanding that the fire alarm was indicating 1200 building? No, I did not. Okay. Nor did you have contact with my client at that point, correct? I did not, no. Right. What's the next thing that happened? I went on my golf cart and headed towards the 1200 building where I then parked the golf cart out of the way so that I can then help the students evacuate the building as protocol calls for when we evacuate for a fire drill. What side of the building did you pull up to? So I was near the 700 building, right underneath the walkway that was there, near the this, uh, the staircase that goes up to the second floor. I'm, I'm there out of the way, so the students have access into the courtyard and out to where the evacuation routes were. Okay, and then what's the next thing that happened? I went into the courtyard. I was uh, proceeding to go into the closer to the 1200 building. I stopped at that moment because I heard some loud noises and I also heard uh, a code red being called over the radio. All right, we'll take those one step at a time. Mm -hmm. Where were you when you heard some shots fired? So I was near the defense, uh, in between the 1200 building and what we call the, the PE courtyard or that, uh, that 900, uh, that uh, PE courtyard basically is called the 700 building right outside of the gym area. Can I ask, first we'll start with the map that is uh, defense F. Can you just take a look at that and see if you can identify roughly where you were? So it's in this area right here. Yep, right here. That's a courtyard right here. This is a staircase. That area, this is a fence area. This is the 1200 building. So I was in that area there, right in between that walkway. That would actually be west of the 1200 building. That's correct? correct. Yeah. Okay. I think you might have said east earlier. Did you mean to say west? I, I don't know, maybe I'm I don't, I don't think I said east, okay. but it is on the west side of the building. It's getting late. I, maybe, okay, so it's definitely the west side, yes. correct? Mm -hmm. And if you can put your finger where you were when you heard shots. I was in this area right here. Okay, thank you. So that would be between the 12 and 1300 building, correct? More so towards, yes, pretty much in between those two areas, but right before it, right? And how close did you get to the 1200 building before you heard shots? About 30 feet. Okay. Could you see anybody 
on the ground? No. And do you recognize what's in this photograph that's been marked as, the, actually it's in evidence as defense one. Do you recognize this photograph? I do. Okay, and what is that in relation to where you were? So that is the west side entrance to the 1200 building, so right outside. Side. Go ahead, sorry. I'm sorry, right outside the admin office. Mm -hmm. All right. And is this the side of the building that you approached? So you I, was, I was opposite. So if this is the building here, I was more toward this way. Okay. But this is the side of the building that you were on. That's correct. correct. Yeah. You had gotten off of your golf cart, correct? Yes. And you were approaching the building, correct? Yes. And how many shots did you hear approximately? Approximately five or six. Did you recognize them as gunfire right away? Not right away, no. What did you think that they might have been? Uh, just loud cracking noises, and then eventually it, it hit me as if it was gunfire. Yeah. And do you have any experience ever hearing gunfire? I have. Tell the jurors about that. I have a permit, and I've gone to the range. I do go to the range on occasion. Uh, I had a, I've had a permit from prior moving to Florida. So in New York City, I had a permit. What kind of permit? It was a, a con, uh, in New York City was a semi-concealed weapon carry or, or a semi-automatic handgun. So even though you've had a lot of experience with gunfire and utilizing guns, at first when you hear the shots, are you saying you didn't recognize right away with certainty that was gunfire? That's correct, I did not. Did you have a thought as to what you thought it might be? Originally when we were responding, we thought it was firecrackers that right. were going off in the building, right. uh, and that's what I was assuming it was okay. originally. And when you were standing approximately 30 feet from the 1200 building, the west side of the 1200 building, where did you believe those shots were coming from? So I couldn't, I could I believe it was coming from behind me because at that point my back was towards the 1200 building. I was facing the 700 building. <coughs> I believe it was coming from behind me. Okay. Uh, however, I couldn't really pinpoint where exactly behind me. Okay. Did you think that they were coming from inside or outside or both? I, I couldn't tell. So what was in play first was possibly inside or outside, correct? Could be. Sure. And if you could show us on this map what possibly could have been the area that you thought the shots were coming from, okay? Include every possibility. So I was standing in this area right here, as yes. I stated earlier. Uh, I, it could have been coming from this area, this area. I'm not, you know, precisely don't know where they're coming from. I'm standing here, and my back was towards that area, so I'm facing this way. I'm going to need to describe what you just said for the record, sure. and maybe you can help me, because mm -hmm. it won't show this, that. Okay. So, first, point to the first place that you said it could, the shots could have been coming from. So, I believe it could, again, it could have been from this back area here, which is the 12, 1300 building. All right, so you're pointing to the 1300 building. Let's, yes. let's start there. Did you know whether it was coming from inside the 1300 building or outside? Oh, no, I couldn't tell. Could you tell whether it was coming from the roof or from a particular floor? Could not tell. Yes. Could you tell whether it was coming from the north side of the 1300 building? No. The west side of the 1300 building? No. The east side? No. The whatever side that I didn't say, because I'm getting that's, tired? That's the south. That's no. the south side, yes. No. You couldn't tell. That was a possibility, correct? Did you also consider that it could have been coming from the parking lot area? Well, I didn't think that far ahead, but it could have been coming from anywhere, right? I, I really couldn't point, point specifically where the shots were. I just know they were, something was from behind me. So could, you couldn't rule out the parking lot, correct? Me, no. All right, and this parking lot area, okay, this is what they call the senior lot? That's correct. How many cars does it hold approximately, do you know? About 500. So this is a massive, large lot, correct? Is. Mm -hmm. is that a yes? Yes, it is. All right. Did you also think that the shot, since you were standing over here and it was behind so you? So I was standing over here. Oh, that's correct. Okay. Did you also consider it could be in this courtyard area between the 12 and 1300 Sure. Building? Yes? <laughs> and you couldn't tell whether it was extended northbound or south or east, west? No, I could not tell you. Okay. Also, it could have been 1200 building, correct? Correct. I couldn't tell you. Could it have been any sides of the 1200 building that you heard shots from? Again, I couldn't identify where they were coming from. I understand. Mm -hmm. 
Did you ever hear anyone order a code red? I did. Who did you hear order a code red? So over the radio, I heard uh, Mr. Morford call a code red. You recognize his voice, correct? I did. Did you ever see any kids come out of neighboring buildings? So the students were starting to come out of the 700 building and the bottom part of that, which is connected to what we call the, the, six, the 500, 600 area. So students were coming out of that area because there are, there are three buildings connected to each other. Approximately, you know, you can't give an exact number, approximately how many students were coming out of the 700 and the connecting 500 building? So the, 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 so classrooms were evacuated. When you talk about classrooms, you're talking about 25, 30 students per class that are coming out of that area. So I would say anywhere between. And in and, and my visibility, there was maybe five or six classrooms there, so I'm seeing a crowd of students, maybe 60, 70, 80 students coming out of that area. How many total? I didn't, I didn't hear you. How many so total? what I saw was about 60 or to 70 or 80 students coming out because they evacuated those buildings, but that whole building houses uh, close to 20 classrooms. Okay. So how many total students, both combining the 700 and the, you said the adjoining the 500, 500 building, okay. which is right below it. So and how many students are we talking about? Anywhere between 600 to 1,000 students can be in that building. Okay. Were you ever asked to compile a list of all the students that came out of the buildings? No, I was not. Is that something that could be done by going to the office and printing? Out who it's a matter of a master schedule, yes. Okay. When, the, when you heard the shots and you didn't know where they were coming from, did you look around? I did. And could you tell by looking around where they were coming from? I could not. You didn't see any smoke? I did not, no. You didn't see any blood? No, I did not. You didn't smell anything that led you to believe it was coming from the 1200 building? I did not. You didn't see any kids running out of buildings other than the ones well, that... Well, not the 1,200 building. I was seeing students coming out of the 700 building. Got it. Have you ever experienced an echo in that area before? Yes. Describe for the jurors, first, before the shooting, what you experienced. So that though, that's a courtyard. So during passing, you can hear uh, it's very loud. There's a very loud underneath the staircase because it's a covered walkway. And, uh, and, and it's a courtyard, so the noise does get trapped in that area. Okay, and on the day of the shooting, that also would have been in play, correct? Yes. Um, there's nothing wrong with your hearing, is there? No. Okay. After the first shots that you heard, did you ever hear any additional shots? I only heard the five to six shots that I mentioned earlier. Okay. You never saw any muzzle flashes, correct? I did not. Never saw any bullets coming out of windows or anything? I did not. Did you ever see my client during the shooting? I did. And what did you see? I saw uh, Deputy Pierce standing uh, at, the, at the other side of, of where I was originally. That uh, was considerably far from you, correct? It was uh, at, at the end of the 1200 building on the east side of that opposite of that uh, east entrance of the 1200 building. And what did you see him doing, sir? I saw him leaning against, uh, I guess, a column that was there. Uh, I believe his hands were occupied with his radio, but I couldn't tell what was in his hands. I know he was on, he, one hand was leaning on, on, on his shoulder here, and he was, he seemed to be uh, leaning towards that, and then he had something else in his hand. I just couldn't identify what that other item was. One final question. If in that moment, when you heard those shots and someone told you, go precisely where those shots were, could you have done that? Objection to speculation. No, that's overruled. So I don't want you to guess, but if you can answer the question based on your personal Can you repeat the question? Yes. In that moment, thinking back, when you heard the shots, if someone had said, go towards the shots, could you have identified precisely where those shots were coming from? No, I couldn't. Thank you, sir. Appreciate you coming in. Cross examination, go Good afternoon, Mr. Rosario. How's it going? I speak quickly. If you need to slow down, feel like okay? All right, so let's go back to the 14th of February, 2018. Um, Scott Peterson is the school resource officer at Emma State, correct? That's correct. What are his daily tasks? 
basically, he comes in in the morning. Uh, he does. He was. He would assist with traffic, uh, as we all do. We all had our different, uh, uh, I guess, stations where we were located. Some of them had coverages in different areas. I, I recall him covering traffic uh, in the morning along with other police officers and crossing guards and things of that nature. Uh, then he will come in and he would either meet with parents or assist administrators uh, uh, with it throughout the day. What does that mean, assist administrators? Uh, if there were any cases where we needed to consult with, with, with uh, Deputy Peterson at the time uh, uh, regarding anything that, in, uh, that included some infraction by a student. So not necessarily crimes, also infractions. Well, only if they dealt with crimes. We did it if it was a school discipline nature only, then we wouldn't consult with him. Only if it was something to deal with law enforcement. Okay. So he would also be responsible, like, if kids were vaping? Correct. That could have been, if, it's a, if that, that's an infraction that's covered in our code of student conduct, right? Uh, but if it was an actual crime, that effect, then we would consult with him at that time. So if there was a vaping uh, event, then we would, we would consult with him. Okay, so in that situation. Events you consult with him. But if there's like a minor traffic crash in the parking lot, he will also assist with that as well. Okay. Anything else off the top of your head? His daily tasks that he would do. I know he he helped uh, during class changes. He will go out uh, during the class changes as well. He will be standing out there either in the courtyard or in the front office, or if the front office needed him for whatever reason. Uh, uh, those are the kind of things that I to make sure students get to their classes. Before correct, the correct, correct, and orderly. Correct. Like kind of almost like truancy type issues. N not, I wouldn't say truancy, but just making sure that there's that that students are get, moving from one class to the next in an orderly fashion without any disturbances with with each other. So now. Fire alarm goes off, and you went to the panel. I Correct. can't say the word. Oh, Enunciator panel, okay. I know. I struggled with it, too. So. Where is that panel? <laughs> that panel is actually located in what we had as Deputy Peterson's office. So it's in Mr. Peterson's office? Yes. And that's the only panel in the school? That's the only panel that I recall. Okay. Yes. And on that panel, if you could just describe for the jury, what, is, what does the panel look like? It's a set of... of uh, numbers and uh, what we call fish numbers which are your classrooms plus a little light next to those areas that is pretty much like a map of the school that shows you where that particular fire alarm was triggered from. So that when the fire alarm is triggered it would say for instance 1200 building? It would it would indicate the 1200 building. Okay. Yes. And did it also say something like gas that day? I don't recall if it said gas or not. Your screen is actually interactive, and you can draw on it. You're on a technical topic, so let me see if you can manage that here. I'm scrolling just a touch. So you can actually mark this <laughs> with your finger. Okay. Okay. So when you hear the fire alarm go off, where are you? you so I'm in building one. Can you just mark that with an X approximately where you were? Mm -hmm. This is building one right here. Okay. So you get into the golf cart, mm -hmm. and which route do you drive? So I go across the main courtyard, what we call the main courtyard, which is through here, across that way. And did you park where you ended that line? I parked right, right alongside that area there, which is okay. it's hard to see the map, but there's a staircase there because of the cupboard right alongside that staircase. Okay. And that's your assigned area for fire? Yes. Okay. Now, when you're standing there, you hear shots, you hear the loud noise. So I can t I, once I get off the golf cart, I came over to this area a little bit further out, which is this area right here, right by, there's a fence there, okay. right? A fence with a gate, so I stopped at that area there. So I can visualize the, the traffic flow both from the ball fence here and, and this area coming to me from the students. So that's where, that's where I, I stopped and heard the gunfire. And you're facing south, you're facing away. And I'm facing the building, correct. You said building, so you're I'm, I'm facing the 700 building away from the 1200 building. So where did you stop? You approximated that it's about 30 feet? I approximate about 30 feet. Could it be more than that? It could be. Okay. Now, when you got up there after the fire alarm, did you look to the east side, I'm sorry, the west side doors of the building? So there's a bush there. I, 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 there were, I had no visibility to the door. So if, if, if Aaron Feist was on 
the ground at that point in time, you wouldn't have been able to see him. No. Not from your vantage point. Not from my vantage point. You know, after you hear the shots, it's not part of your job responsibility to investigate the location of the shots, is it? No. What is your responsibility during a code red? So during a code red is to ensure that the students and staff are secured behind a locked door and then get myself secured behind a locked door. And you did that that day? So I didn't get myself secured behind a locked door. I did get the students back into this building. I did hear another radio call come in after the code red where uh, one of our another assistant principal had, had students out in the field on the, <coughs> by the 900 building. Can you just mark where that is? Sure. So the 900 building is right here. And she has students in this area here all out of the building. Okay. Right? And that building houses, again, another approximately about another eight to a thousand students. Eight hundred to about a thousand students in that area. So that's where a lot of the students went after the fire alarm slash. So program. that building had evacuated. Yeah. Right? Completely. Uh, and and the other assistant principal, Ms. Figueroa, had a call over a radio that she was outside if she wanted more indication. I at that time I, I indicated that uh, to hang tight. I got my students secure that I was going to head over along with uh, the head custodian that was in the courtyard in the area with me as well. We both went out to that area to assist her with the students and not bring the students back. We evacuated the students over to West Place. So West Place, you evacuated Correct. West. That's right. that, the person with you is the head custodian, Ed Suarez? The, yeah, Ed Suarez, yes. Mm -hmm. Now, over the radio you heard Jeff Morford announce the code red. Correct. You never heard Scott Peterson announce the code red. I did not, no. Now you said on, on direct, um, the sound was kind of trapped in the courtyard. Which courtyard are you talking about? So this is called the PE courtyard, which is, be, so this is the gym. This building right here is the gym, right? This is the 700 building right here. This is the 500 building, and in here is a courtyard with a, with a staircase. So it's like an open, smaller courtyard. There's a main courtyard where I cut across that big one. This here is the main courtyard. So, I, that, oh, sorry. so I was in, standing in the smaller courtyard, which is what we call the PE courtyard. Okay. And where, <coughs> Mark, did you see uh, Scott Peterson standing? So Scott Peterson, I saw him standing. Now the trees blocks it a little bit, but he was outside around this area here. After you secured the students in the 500 building, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Um, you then moved south with Mr. Suarez. I then moved towards the 900 building south. That's correct. How long would you estimate? Can you can just estimate this? Were you in the position facing south to help the students after the shots fall? Mm -hmm. Five to seven minutes. When you saw Scott Peterson, where was he looking? He was facing the 1200 building. And the shots, they, they were loud? They were. Assistant principal, what were you so I was in charge of seniors and guidance, math, and the career technical education program. So different APs, different assistant principals have different tasks. That's correct. Mm -hmm. okay. As part of your assignment, did you attend a uh, class in January of 2018 in regards to code reds? I did. Was Mr. Peterson there? I do. We, I believe all security staff was there, yes, including the, uh, Deputy Peterson, yes. And at that class, what were you taught to do in your position? So um, under code red, we were taught, taught to lock down, secure the building, and then wait for law enforcement to come in and take over the situation. We basically just ensured that the building was locked down. And law enforcement would take care of it. Any shooters if it's an active shooter situation? So for me, law enforcement takes care of the situation after that. Yes, once we're locked down, we are not to, Code red for us means no mobility, right? Lock down, stay behind closed door until you hear further from law enforcement. Now, after you went to Westlake with the students, you actually went back to MSD later that day, right? So it was about, yes, later in the evening. It was about 5, 6 o'clock in the evening that I 
has returned back to them. Because you were like the IT guru. Correct. So he, part of your responsibility, or what you were asked to do, was basically download the videos that we see. Correct. That's correct. the school resource officer did only person with a gun, correct? Correct. At any point in time during the five to seven minutes that you were herding the students back into the 500, at any point in time did you turn around and face the 1200 building? Briefly. I don't think I, I might have, I might have just looked back. Like kind of glanced back? As opposed yes. To you didn't position your entire body down. I did not. Most of the time I was facing the 700 building. And when you were, let's say, hurting them back, I'm just going to erase this for a second. Where were you standing? Were you standing in the same spot that you were? So I was, I was a little bit. A little bit, away. Sorry. A little bit here, hopefully. There we go. Okay. So as I mentioned earlier, there's a fence right here. So once I was hurting the students back, I was a little bit further in, so I was like in this area right here that's like in the center of the courtyard itself. Uh, there's a staircase. This is the opening of the staircase. It's a staircase there, and then there's an open walkway on right above here. So if you go across here, this is actually a walkway where students come out of the classrooms, they walk in that area, and then they head towards the staircase. So okay. I, I'm, they have visibility to me, and I have visibility, visibility to them. So any student going down that staircase or on that walkway, you were telling Correct. to get away? To get back to get back and, and lock themselves down into the and classroom. And you lock in the classroom, did any of them flee south? So I, all the students I saw, I saw them go back into the classroom. At any time during the time that you're here in this area by the 1200 building, including the time where you glance back and you look at the 1200 building, was there any evidence to you in real time that there was a shooter inside the 1200 building shooting children? And Not to me, no. No, correct? Not to me, no. Based on that, we read from just one question. Was it your job to identify where an active shooter was? No, on sir. On Stoneman Douglas campus? No, sir. Nothing further. Okay, is the witness excused? Yes, Your Honor. All right, sir, you may step down. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, based on uh, the time, we'll press pause in the trial at this point. A little bit of a different schedule going forward tomorrow, uh, only because of some other matters that I have to handle, which have nothing to do with this trial. Uh, I don't want you waiting around for me in the morning, so you're going to have the morning back at your normal lives. What I'm going to ask you to do is tomorrow, which is Thursday, June 22nd, um, eat lunch on your own, and I'm going to ask you to be at the jury room at 12.30 p.m., 12.30 p.m., and then we're just going to go through the rest of the afternoon tomorrow. So and again, that's so you're not waiting for me while I'm handling other matters which have nothing to do with this trial. Okay. So ladies and gentlemen, same admonition as always. Please do not discuss the facts of the case. The evidence, the witnesses, or the testimony amongst yourselves or anyone else. Please do not do any research on the case. I'm going to ask you to continue not watch the news, do not read the newspaper. You will leave a notepad in your chairs. They will be waiting for you when you come back. Have a good night. I will see you tomorrow at 12.30 p.m. 12.30 p.m. in the jury room. Outside the presence of the jury, state anything you need me to address before we recess the trial until tomorrow. No, you're Depends on anything you need me to address. No, you're okay, so the trial will be in recess until tomorrow, which is Thursday, 
June 22nd at 12.30 p.m. Division FX will be in recess until tomorrow, Thursday, June 22nd at 8.45 a.m. I hope you all have a good rest of your night. All right, Madam Court Reporter, that concludes the meeting.